call the uh, May 21st school committee meeting to order. Uh, thank you for everyone in attendance. Uh, tonight we'll have a, a presentation from Understanding Disabilities uh, followed by uh, the uh, special education update uh, and then various uh, housekeeping type items. Uh, bef before we start that, I would like to have the consent agenda. Um, I move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Is there anything anyone would like removed? Yes. Do, oh, do you want to go ahead? I can a second. Oh, is it? It might be the same item. The minutes that contain the vote. They're not in. Okay. Second agenda. I withdraw. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Linda. The May seventh. Um, there's just a slight omission in the May 7th it's minutes. Oh, it's not in the consent agenda. No, it's, I'm talking about the minutes from May 7th. It looks like a separate agenda item. I think it's a separate oh. agenda item. It's not in the consent just agenda. Just three donations. Yep, the consent agenda is just three donations. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's different. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Five zero. Uh, we will now have uh, the understanding disabilities. I'm sorry, we public comment. Public comment. <laughs> Rough night. Is there any any public comment for any something that's not? Yes, Mrs. Lieberman. Thank you, Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I just wondered um, whether there was any chance of getting a math update or at the very minimum, uh, an update on the curriculum maps. Uh, that had been requested by the school committee last fall for February and never happened. And the math update had been on the schedule since uh, probably the beginning of last school year and was canceled. It had been scheduled for March 19th and never happened. And it would be really nice for the public to be able to see that, especially it's one of the superintendent's four key goals. And uh, in order to fairly evaluate, um, we need to know how we're doing with that, especially in light of the fact that new math courses have ro been rolled out for next year and nobody really knows what's in there. Pre uh, the former pre-calculus course is gone and so we need to make sure that teachers have curriculum maps and pacing guides so we know what we're getting and also how we're doing. How are we doing on MCAS? How are we doing a lot of new initiatives and not a lot of information on assessment. Could we get a math update? Uh -huh. Dr. Dougherty. Sure, I'd love to. Um, Thank you. Not give you a math update right now, but well, I'll I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but could we schedule one? Uh, uh, well, to reschedule I, March I think 19th. I, if, if I could, I, I think we actually have had several updates on math. They've not been formal, full blown math presentations. In November, you had a full MCAS presentation, which included math. We have not mm -hmm. had any MCAS results since then. So the MCAS results in November are the only MCAS results we have right now. Um, we also had a math presentation as part of our overall mid-year presentation on March 19th. As part of that, Mr. Martin gave a math presentation specifically, and there was a set of slides that actually are in that packet, uh, if you go to the school committee packet for March 19th. And then two weeks ago, as part of my goals update and district improvement plan update, I also gave additional math update and data. So there has been actually three um, school committee meetings where we have discussed math data. But curriculum maps, um, last, uh, they, uh, the K through five curriculum maps have been done for math supposedly since last fall and with the teachers. Have we made zero progress since then? Um, so I believe on progress? March 19th that question was asked and we said that at that point because we were not going to be able to um, get those done before the end of the year because we currently do not have an assistant superintendent. Well, right. So, um, but we made no progress during the time between September and March then. So, so we the, have grade the six curriculum, done, grade seven the, done. The curriculum that you're referring to, if you just go to the curriculum frameworks, the curriculum frameworks explain to us exactly the standards that we need to be teaching in each grade. That's what we're going to be developing the maps from. So if you need a guide, okay, it's the so curriculum frameworks. Well, right. I mean, the state's had that. We've had that since 2011. But um, right. 
the, uh, the whole idea. If you're rolling out new courses, or if you stop rolling out new courses, then we can wait and catch up with curriculum maps. But if we're rolling out new courses, I feel like people need to know what's in there. So I That's think just my take. Uh, I think Thank you. Potentially, Dr. Doherty, we could maybe set up a folder on the web uh, school committee web or the school web page that includes the things that you just mentioned so that there's one place to get a compilation of the, the of the presentations that were done on March 19th the uh, the MCAS results from November uh, and I guess that the link you just mentioned about the uh, this, the frameworks the frameworks does that does that uh, it's one is that what was going to be in the math update on March 19th so, yeah, yeah. well case, those are all fine. the things I actually did two, hearing, yeah. I um, I did it two weeks ago I was here I did it two weeks ago so actually looking at two weeks ago's presentation is probably so I can do. I can definitely make put a folder. It all in one spot, and so the community right. knows. Because a lot of people didn't go. If if we had known we were getting a dis the district improvement plan superintendent goals end of year update, uh, more people would have come. This didn't appear in the published packet, which is that's the second thing I wanted to discuss. Is that uh, could the school committee develop some policies that are universally applied for everyone? Because uh, it, right now it seems. Uh, that we don't always get what we think we're going to get at a school committee meeting and that's not right and some correspondence makes it into the packet sometimes it doesn't can I I just want to say a couple of things one is as assistant superintendent Craig Martin recommended and Dr. Doherty has reiterated the frameworks the math frameworks are very specific in terms of what's included in the classes, what the teachers need to teach. And there are model class classes there that use the different names that I know you're taking issue with, that it changed, the um, curriculum frameworks changed in March 2017. And if you go to that link, which would be great if it's in on the website, but anybody can go to the Math Frameworks 2000. 17 on the DESC site and it describes the algebra and trig um, course as opposed to the pre-calculus course and it goes through what's included in or would be included in that model class and the other thing that I wanted to say is that it would be very hard everybody gets the agenda and on the agenda for the two weeks ago it said that the superintendent was going to talk about his evaluation. So he did. He talked about what we need to do, and then he gave a presentation about what was going to be included. To expect that those are all done to be in a packet by Friday, I think our staff tries their best. But, I see um, them here seven days a week, and sometimes those packets don't come to us updated until Monday. Oh, I understand that things can happen last minute sometimes, but the Board of Selectmen, their regular policy is that if something isn't in in time, that it has to go in the next meeting, and that seems fair, because I think if people had known uh, what was actually in the packet before uh, May 7th, the May 7th meeting was a blank evaluation form. So I think a lot of people, myself included, I almost didn't come, was I thought it was about the process. I didn't realize there was going to be anything of substance and how would how could you have known? And then somebody, a friend of mine trying to watch at home couldn't make any sense of it because she didn't have this in front of her. So it's just, couldn't we have the same policies for school committee as for board of selectmen? I'm just throwing it out there. Yes. What has been a consistent practice in the school district for several years is that the agenda is released on the Wednesday before the Monday school committee meeting. The packet is released on the Friday. We put as much information as we can in the packet on Friday. Um, in that packet that you referred to, there was a very detailed memo, and there was also the two documents. Um, every single year, this has been an agenda item around this time, and I've always done a presentation that you have in your hand there. So that has always been the expectation of the school committee is that when I'm going through the superintendent evaluation process for the end of the year, that I'm doing a presentation of my goals and a goals update. 
That's that's been the expectation since I've been and, and the since goals we've done. It doesn't have to be in the packet ahead of time. I do my best. I worked on that all that weekend. Okay. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to get it done beforehand. Okay. We're not required to have it done. I know. State law is 48 hours to I have know. the agenda done. That's it, just the agenda. I know, but... We do the best we can. But just in the interest of transparency, remember there was the trust gap uh, in the override survey. Everybody remembers that. Um, I'm just going to just say, even though it's not required, what's required is an agenda item saying, for example, we're going to talk about the budget. But it's just annoying is, is the, um, and it feels like lack of transparency when the budget doesn't appear 48 hours ahead. So uh, I'm just using that as an example. When, uh, or or uh, I'm going to talk about district goals. That's in the agenda, but the district goals aren't in the packet of information. So all of those things that that you that that document you held up, there's no collaboration or discussion upon. We don't see it until it gets out that night either. And you know we recognize that there's there's circumstances that that ha make that happen well all I'm suggesting maybe so, it should be postponed till the next meeting because yeah. then the more members of the public might have attended I, I don't want to get bogged down but that's just what I wanted to say is please consider yeah. following the same protocol that the Board of Selectmen does because I, I checked with their their uh, their chair and um, and was told that uh, if something doesn't make it into the packet in time that it has to be moved to the next meeting yeah. which Thanks. seems like a compromise yeah. <laughs> yes uh, just to quickly Andy Friedman select board to quickly do I have to go up there yes please uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah the, there is to my knowledge no uh, select board policy um, where thing, everything has to be in the packet um, that goes out Thursday night. And in fact, um, it has to be on the agenda unless it's within 48 hours. So I'm not aware of that policy. I could be missing something. But things do get added to the packet between Thursday night on the select board, just like they do here, um, be, because town manager is not a, able to prepare it in time, something like that. So I just wanted to yeah. clarify that, that that's not the case for the board of selectmen, to, to my knowledge. And anyway, and it does happen. And you know, Mrs. Lieberman, oh, there you are. Uh, and I'm not trying to be a, sound like a wise guy. I can assure you that anything that's on the agenda will be a discussion at the meeting. It's not going to be a you know, it's not just a placeholder for a for a hollow, uh, you know, uh, limited presentation. There will always be something about that, unless we specifically say, like I I can recall. Well, the math that, that I'll use that as an example, we had to take that off of the agenda for for other discussions that that came up, and that happens uh, throughout the course of a year where. You know, there are uh, certain uh, more, uh, I don't want to say more, but some pressing issue will come up that will uh, force something else off the agenda. But if it stays on the agenda, uh, you can be assured that there will be, if there's, no, if there's no backup material to that in the packet, it will be available that night and we get it at the same time and there will be a, a lively discussion on it. Thank you. Yes. I just, I just have one more <coughs> thought. Um, it's really nice to get presentations ahead of time, but sometimes I think it can also be pro problematic because there are bullets on slides that aren't completely, uh, aren't complete, and when someone comes to present. They're giving the context. They're giving the information in the slide. And the, the expectation that those presentations will always be put out before doesn't seem reasonable to me because of that, but also because the deadline is the Monday when it needs to be presented. I would love to have, and many of them are, but many of them aren't. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Yes. So two, two quick points. Um, one of the two microphones. So two quick points, just addressed to my fellow committee members, really. Um, the first point is just about our, our process, and I'm wondering if, I mean, this is the, the comment Ms. Lieberman's made. To me, just I accept that as an opportunity or a challenge to us of, hey, can we, can we better serve the public and how we structure our deliberations? One suggestion I have, and we don't have to take it up tonight, would be whether there would be an opportunity. Very often when you leave meetings, there's people write down action items. And if next to future business, when we hit item J on our existing agenda, whether we could routinely invite members of the committee to just identify future agenda items that the night's discussion has prompted them and, and, and the public comment is part of that, right? So anything that committee members would like to see on a future agenda, if we could flag that explicitly, I would find that helpful. And that and that's always been out there. Oh, it's that, a, it, that's why it's on the, you know. And, and just, just to be very deliberate about that, yeah. um, that future business that, and maybe explicit that's a, and proposed future agenda items, I, I would welcome that as part of our normal uh, process every week. Uh, and the second point is just is on the substance of what Ms. Lieberman said. Um, when when Ms. Kelly starts, I'm wondering if, if we couldn't find, after an appropriate period of time, and I'll defer to the superintendent on this, but I think it would be good to have just an update of, of what her you know, impressions are, just some kind of presentation on after she's got her feet under her and had a chance to, to look at where, where we are and, and the parts of the district improvement plan that relate to her role. I'd be very interested in scheduling an update as on our calendar. So I know I noticed we have a calendar that goes out quite a ways. So I'd like to see that in the fall. Okay. Maybe I'm flexible in the timing. I just like to address. I think that would be a good venue to address Ms. Lieberman's question. Just yes. a quick point about letters, if I could. So um, there are many kinds of letters and forms of letters, and I this is not a global comprehensive statement. If there's been a letter someone's expected in the packet that hasn't been in. But I will say that there are times when um, someone writes to the district with private information. And even if a parent is willing to share information about a child, sometimes it's really the, the committee needs to exercise discretion about um, protecting a child's privacy or a family's privacy or personnel. So there can be reasons like that that letters don't necessarily appear in the packet as well. Thanks. Any other public comment? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Um, I shouldn't have just looked at you. I have said <laughs> Usually when I present, I stand. Will that be That's fine. Yeah. All right. I'm, a, I'm a fidgeter. <laughs> yes, will that be a problem for That's television? Maybe move the mic to no, the RCTV no, corner just so we can Oh, because it's, it's, it's being recorded. Being recorded. Being I wonder if I'm, am I loud enough, do you think, yeah. for it to be yeah. recorded? It's my teacher voice. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll give it a shot then. Uh, so was, um, thank you for having us. Okay, my name is Tara Price, and I am this year's program leader for Understanding Disabilities. And this is, Karen, do you want to introduce yourself? Karen Saranich, I'm the Executive Director for Understanding Disabilities. So again, thank you for inviting us to present. Um, this is exciting for me. So about UD, um, we're going to be talking about UD, as you well know. I think that it's very hard to be in Reading and not know really, um, at least a little bit, about understanding disabilities. We're going to talk a little bit about our programming, specifically this year. We're going to talk about um, understanding disabilities in the community, because we've had some exciting events um, that we have been a part of this year that we would like to call your attention to. And um, our newest, I guess, tool to get to the community and the students is our UD at Home website. So our mission, if you don't know, is to help children see beyond people's disabilities and focus on the ways that we are all the same inside. This is crucial, um, we think, to today's children. Okay, um, There's so much happening in the world and we really do find that um, it's getting harder and harder to teach empathy. Right? That is such something that is, is so necessary in today's world, but I can say as an educator in a different country um, that it often can be sometimes pushed aside for other things, and I really do believe that UD helps kind of cohesively bring what 
teachers in the classroom do, as well as what we do, which is, again, see beyond people's disabilities that we are all the same. But not just disabilities, just maybe different thoughts, different opinions, um, different backgrounds. So at our um, jail and bail, they often do, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar because I've seen <laughs> lots of your faces before at our jail and bail, we often ask the public why they think understanding disabilities is needed. And so you can see there is um, three different points of view. All right, UD's value. So why is UD important to the Reading community? And we think it's very important because it strengthens already the foundation that this community has, which is inclusion, right? Inclusion of all abilities, all creeds, um, religion, we increase learning for all students and it increases acceptance of all differences. And again, like I said, I can't stress how important that I know you know that stressing, our diff or stressing the acceptance of all differences is very, very important. So we were founded in 1984. We've had continuous programs since then. Uh, that's about 33 years of change and we actually have counted and we, impact over we have impacted over 10,000 students. Okay, so our curriculum runs from um, grade one to grade five. We do all of these things. So we start off easy right in October with food allergies. That's the first exposure that children have to UD. We continue with physical disabilities and we bring in a speaker. We have visual and hearing disabilities where we bring in speakers. Some classes will get a Reading um, community member who is blind. Some classes will get a Reading community member that has um, a visual disability. Grade three, we talk about autism spectrum disorder, which is great because there are many families that are impacted by um, this particular disorder. We talk about developmental disabilities in grade four and learning disabilities in grade four. That's about the time where we deemed and our experts deemed that you know kids start to realize that you know maybe there are some differences that maybe are not so visual. Um, and so we think that that fits right well into that kind of niche when they're starting to look at differences and we're saying, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to be different, okay? And then grade five, emotional and behavioral challenges. As you know, if you have children, grade five, puberty starts. Um, things start to get a little bit uh, haywire sometimes. And if we can address emotional and behavior behavioral challenges, it often allows kids to go, okay, I, I kind of get what maybe is going on and here's some ways that I can start to cope or people that I can start to reach out to, right, to get some help. Again, we do presentations in classroom. Every single one of our presentations has at least one hands-on learning as up to four activities of hands-on learning. And with the exception of food allergies and emotional and behavioral challenges, Every presentation has a guest speaker, and there you can see that that's Kaylin Luby. Some of you may know Kaylin. She is a longtime Reading resident and actually started speaking for Understanding Disabilities at about, I think, grade five. Third, third, I think it was third grade. Third she grade, saw a even. presentation in second grade, um, and, a, and a speaker came in, and she was inspired and said, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. and she's been speaking as a part of the Understanding Disabilities um, program ever since. And she's in college now. She actually comes back um, over her spring break. And, um, and she talks to large committees, actually national committees, about her experiences. And again, we continue our program through to middle school where we provide middle school speakers. And hopefully they connect with an, an individual. And this is Chad Hines. This was last year's. I didn't get to see it because I was teaching. Understanding <laughs> disabilities lesson. Okay, so for 2017-2018, we had 102 total presentations. We're wrapping up this week. Yay! Um, we had 200 classroom volunteers from our community. So that would be um, parents in Reading. That would be grandparents, aunts, and uncles. We also had some people from outside of Reading that actually found out about our program and thought it was really great and wanted to get some, you know, see how it works kind of thing. And we've had 27 speaker sessions to date. Now we do a lot of things not just in the school. We do a lot of things for our community. Sorry, I keep on standing right in front of you. 
for our community. So we do teal pumpkins um, along with our food allergies for, does everybody know teal pumpkins? Yes, great, fantastic. Um, we are available at our Reading Street Fair. First annual Parent University, yay, it was fantastic, side note. Uh, Martin Luther King Day, we've done events with Reading Public Library, our uh, hands-on hangout. Um, we worked with them to get Rescue and Jessica to come in, and Friends and Family Day that's coming up soon. And so here are a few community speakers. We've had Travis Roy, Shonda Schilling, Dr. Ned Hallowell, and Jeff Bowman. And Mandy Harvey, which was just this past weekend. Do you want to speak to any of those, Karen? How was Mandy Harvey? Mandy amazing. Was awesome. Awesome. Amazing. Right, it was amazing. <laughs> And that's a, a big feather, I think, in our cap to be able to get someone kind of that is in the entertainment sphere. I'm not saying that all of these other people aren't important. Um, they are in their own way. Um, but to get someone that is, uh, you know, that reaches out to a different audience is, I think, a kind of a feather in Karen's cap to be able to convince her to come. The photo on the right is her holding up cards that students from running made for her. She's mm -hmm. going to keep them in her ukulele case, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was really great that they thought to bring those for her. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was impressed by some of the questions during the questions and answer sessions and uh, session that we had there. And um, you know, a lot of our speaker sessions start out the same way. Kids are a little timid. They might have to about disability a little bit. And it always turns to them just trying to connect. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? And it was the same. It was just them wanting to know her. It wasn't about a disability, it wasn't anything, it was just getting to know her, and um, she thought that was fantastic, and she said she would come back anytime. Yay. Well, and, with that, and to add on, to piggyback onto that idea, a lot of our speakers, we actually get kids, um, that teachers will tell us later that those children would never divulge um, out loud, or have never divulged out loud, that they perhaps have some sort of challenge, learning challenge or disability, and all of a sudden they feel comfortable and confident and safe to be able to say, I have dyslexia, right? I'm on the autism spectrum, and we've seen that over and over, and they actually write it in their accent slips, which is fantastic, and kudos to um, the Reading School community that there is such a safe place that kids feel like they can say those things. Now UD at home, we're very excited. Um, this has been a couple years in the making, I believe. So um, we've expanded awareness to further learning at home, and this is actually from feedback from parents that we've had that said, my child is coming home and they're asking me questions and they want to talk about these topics and I don't know, you know, maybe what to say or how to talk to them about these subjects. You know, it's, it's un, um, uncharted territory for some parents. Um, and so this was basically to reach out those parents and extend that conversation because if we can reach our kids, we reach the parents as well. And that's how you affect change. So we're going to show you a little video about UD at home. No, I don't think you have access. Okay, we don't have enough time? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, I don't have access, wireless access in here. But I think, is it, is it, right on? On? Is it, it should be right on? It should be embedded. Can you, okay, then, yeah. then you should be okay. Yep. Yeah. Right here. Oh, then you're outside. Yep. Yeah. Is there sound? No sound. <sighs> okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can talk over it if that's okay. <laughs> Oh, there's some yeah. Maybe they don't have some cable. Okay. Sound well, alive. we'll just go on. All right. So <coughs> this is our. Um, I don't know where this is where we are. Hard of hearing. So you go into our main page. We have every single one of our units there that shows um, what you can click on. There is a preamble about what the basic idea of the presentation was. There is a question to be asked, and there is a possible answer. We have more to explore, so there's lots of fun stuff, puzzles, read-alouds. Um, we have, I guess we, Shilling from Anna Speaks. 
I don't think so. Leanna speaks is very pop. Yes, it is. So it's showing this is Leanna. She is in third, no. Yep, third grade here. Um, and it allows children to get a little up close and personal. This is actually embedded in one of our presentations. But the kids find that they're just so enthralled with um, how wonderful Leanna is and how her spirit shines through that they actually don't quite get the whole message. And so they often ask us, can we see that video again? So this is um, our way of saying yes and releasing it to the community. So this, this presentation is, is a recap of what's done in the classroom, is that? Um, not exactly. So we'll, we'll have a summary of what's done in the classroom and a question that parents can talk to their kids about um, with a potential answer if the kids don't remember because it's something, again, that we've talked about in the classroom. And then the key videos that we've shown in the classroom are there, but it's not the same presentation. So we don't have the same um, hands-on because we really do believe in hands-on experiential learning. So those aren't the same, but there are often there's puzzles, books, different links. Some videos that didn't make it into our presentation are going to be on there. This is something that we, as we find things that we think are interesting and fit into that particular presentation, we can add to. So we can keep this updated and current. So it's a working document. It's a working where, document, absolutely. So if there's something that you haven't covered yet, it's not in that until after you've covered it? Is that, or is that complete? Uh, so we, all of the lessons have all the information, but there might be additional things. So even though under the emotional and behavioral challenges, we don't necessarily talk about our CASA because it might be a little o uh, over the head of the fifth graders, we have links for the parents. They may need that as a resource and may go there to look for additional resources or additional books on things that may be going on. Um, so we have resources about anxiety or you know, things for them to look further into. Um, and we have it to a place now that it's still a work in progress. And so we're going to continue to add to it additional resources, um, more, um, uh, we're going to have a section for practical um, applications. Um, tips for play dates and birthday parties and, and different things that parents um, may need that information too. Um, so it is somewhat about our lesson and then more. Yes. So to really bring it into the family and make it workable. It's kind of like a bridge, a bridge yes. between what happens in the classroom to home and then being able to expand that to wherever do, they need it to go. Because you do have to remember that we depending on the grade, we might only see them once for one month. So we see one presentation. So for example, this month is um, hard of hearing and low vision. So that's grade two. So our lesson leaders would take the presentations. Well, grade two won't see us again until autism, the autism spectrum disorder lesson, and that may not be till November. So this is that bridge to kind of keep um, you know, that idea of tolerance and empathy and, you know, that we're all the same inside going, that, that conversation that needs to happen, um, going until we get to actually see the kids again. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank okay. you. Okay, so stay for date. <laughs> Um, so, our next big community um, outreach is on Sunday, Sunday, September 9th. We'll probably be contacting lots of people very shortly for our jail and bail. Want to add anything to our jail and bail? Does everybody here know what the jail and bail is? I know that lots of people here. <laughs> We appreciate your support. So we do, of course. Thank you us some time that day. We so appreciative. We do, very appreciative. We'll be, we'll be tracking down. Jean looks mm -hmm. like she broke out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank Are there you. any questions? Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Do you have any way to um, measure the at-home piece? How actively is it being used? Is there any measurement tool behind the website or more anecdotal? Yeah, um, I think right now there's some Google Analytics yeah. um, just to see um, how it's being used, but we want to work with um, the elementary school principals over the summer to try and do a bigger kickoff. So we've been announcing it after our lessons, but we want to kind of do something bigger. 
um, but it was hard to schedule things because this launched, I think, in November or December, and all of their dates are filled. So they have, you know, they're scheduled now. So we want to try and schedule something this summer to kind of have a bigger kickoff and let kids know, you know get some excitement about it and let them know. So the idea is percolating, but nothing set in stone. And then we'll definitely, we'll definitely want to see if it's being used, how much it's being used, and, and definitely get feedback from kids and parents and teachers. And, We'd love to add more. Yeah. We'd just love to know what people would want to see. Yeah. Be Anecdotally, um, I have taught lots of the lessons and I've talked to lots of the kids. And by the time, especially um, when we see the younger kids, and we've had, because it were kind of um, upper elementary heavy towards the beginning of the year simply because younger kids haven't learned how to sit still and they, you know, they have to learn all those things. Um, by the time we see the younger kids, a lot of them, because we've told the older kids in their families, they're like, yeah, I've been on that. <laughs> I've seen that. I've used those puzzles, right? I love Leanna. <laughs> you know? And Leanna is until grade four, but I've had grade twos that say, I've seen her, she's great. You know, so anecdotally, we've actually got some of that as well. I think Yes. Yes. Um, I think there are some things that, for those people who are watching, should know that you you all volunteer to do this work, right? This is at no cost to us. Um, to be fully transparent, <laughs> no cost to the district. Yes. No cost to the district. It's it's remarkable yes. um, the work you do, and uh, for people who are invest, you you need volunteers. Is that right? How, how many hundreds of volunteers did you say you have? Two hundred and thirty this year. Two hundred. And you need, and you can always use more, from what I understand, right? There have been many, I won't say many, but some classes where we have had to modify a little bit because we didn't have um, as many volunteers as we would like. That's right. Yes. And for those, and anybody who's really touched by your program can make a donation, and there's a chance to be a sponsor even, isn't there, for $250 a year or yes, something like that? Program. A private citizen like me can, yes. Absolutely. Okay. And that's how you survive. That's how you do all of this work. And it's remarkable. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Dr. Doxter. I just wanted to add to that. Every year you have a UD gala um, that is not only fun, it's an auction to raise money for you, but also I got to meet Kaylin Luby again. She was my kid's age, actually, I believe. Um, and to meet her again and hear her speak was really inspiring. So there are ways for us adults to get the hands-on experience as well right. and, and support before, UD. Yeah, the year before was Jana Hitzos, who's who speaks to our third graders for the autism lesson, and she sang. Oh, she was amazing. Um, yeah, so we try to incorporate um, people from our lessons. I think our first year was um, Molly Sullivan Sliney, yes, the Olympic fencer, and she had done her presentation as well. So we try and, and share as much of our lessons as we can in that way, and, and really kind of show off this. this I mean, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> but really, the the message is that we really are the same inside, and that people that do experiences, exper we all experience challenges. These people that experience these kinds of challenges can do anything that they want to do. Right, the sky's the limit, and that's what we try and tell kids. The sky's the limit for you. You can do anything that you want to do. Everybody has challenges, but you can overcome them. Oh yes, I just wanted to yell. I'll yell, and you can repeat it. Um, have you guys ever been recognized, like nationally in the news, anything, like for what you do? Nationally, or like in Massachusetts? We received the Cummings Foundation. Years ago, we do the curriculum. Um, what was the common but they never, nobody's done a spotlight on UD or within Reading, lots. Um, I think from Andy Harvey, she was kind of that idea was picked up, but it wasn't necessarily. It was just you know this is what's happening in Reading through certain sites and some of our speakers. Um, no, I know that anybody is involved with. Um, for example, I've pitched um, to a couple of. Uh, grant committees now, and a lot of people have said, um, would you consider expanding to our committee, or our town, um, this is specifically Woburn, Wakefield, you know, a bunch of other places, and uh, we've said yes, but we, at this time we don't have the manpower, 
and we're very much focused on doing what we do well, which is reaching Reading students. We don't, get, we don't want to get too big for our bridges right now and forget that, you know, this is what we're here for. We'd love to expand, we just don't have the manpower to do that right now. Would you agree, Karen? Oh, I 100% agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's not for lack of wanting and thinking this would be great in other communities. It's just, it, it, we can't do it right now. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Move to approve the resolution as revised, calling for full funding of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. So this was uh, discussed at our last meeting, and uh, the the appropriate resolution wording wasn't in the packet at that time. Uh, Ms. Webb provided. Uh, so it's an update on that. Does anyone have any questions? All those in favor? Five zero. I do have a follow-up question. Sure. So in the packet are the letters to our individual um, legislators. And I was wondering, they I think they were called model letters, draft copies of the letters. Do we have a plan to sign them and send them these particular letters? Uh, Elaine was running with that. I'll, I'll yeah, they're signed. Up. Her name is at the bottom. She, it looks like they, I think they already out. went out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Do you need to prove the, the minutes also? Or? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, right. And May seven. Yeah, I was just waiting until, but we can do that. Now. Sure. Uh, okay. So, move to approve the open session minutes dated May seventh, two thousand eighteen. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, any? Yes. At discussion. Um, <coughs> It reports on page five um, that I talked about the upstander training and um, Lori Hoden and I led, but she's not mentioned in here. And I'm hoping that I wasn't rushing through and didn't mention her, but she's she was instrumental in making, creating the training. So is that a friendly amendment? Um, was it was it stated at the meeting? I believe stated? I did. It was not stated at the meeting. Okay, so we checked, we checked our CTD. Oh, all so. right. Sorry to make the extra work. Is it a friendly amendment then to add it? You, you can't add something in the meeting. It wasn't stated. Can. Okay, so I can thought I? Were saying that it was if it wasn't stated, no. Okay, I thought I had, but if I didn't, then is there a way for me to make the statement just to did. give her? Sorry, you I just did. did. <laughs> so if I could, in yeah. your report, you could maybe say it in your report, and then Mrs. Angles can capture it yeah. that way. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? Five zero. Okay. Uh, we'll now have the uh, special education update. Right. So I really would like to thank UD for all they do to really help support us and support the culture that we have in the <coughs> district around students with disabilities. Um, I'm calling this an end of the year update, um, but I was talking to Dr. Doherty ahead of this, so please be mindful we have still have a lot of time left in the school year. So there are certain data points as we go through this that I really can't capture accurately until the school year is over, just because we're still up and running and doing a lot of work um, and pretty busy. Um, so tonight, really what I'd like to do is I'm going to provide you an update on the mid-cycle review that we've talked about. We started off um, in September talking about that. We also had an update in November, so I want to provide you another update on that. Provide an update on the OCR compensatory services. I'm going to give you a snapshot of some of our data. 
some details on what we're doing and what I did was go back into previous presentations the Walker presentations and other things to sort of capture and provide you an update so it feels a little more linear and related to topics we've already talked about we'll have an update from CPAC and then I have some focus areas for next school year to share with the committee so I put in natural breaks for questions so if we can hold that and you can kind of take notes as I present that would make it kind of flow a little bit um, so our mid-cycle review on March 29th we um, needed to submit a progress report so these are the criteria I really didn't put a lot of information this is just a snap uh, a picture of what Desi has provided us so for SE 9 our corrective action plan was approved and um, they see that as being um, corrected which is our work around the um, uh, issuing of IEPs within the 45 days timeline when it's an initial or reevaluation. SE22, um, if you recall, is related to compensatory services and we've been working with the department um, regarding um, providing compensatory services if a staff member is not available to provide the services outlined in the IEP. So if there's a delay in implementation or if there's a pattern of not providing a service, we have an obligation to provide compensatory services. So we have that partially approved. We did um, finally work through with the Department of Education on some guidance for our staff that I've received that partial approval for so what I'm working on right now is we are rolling out that language with the staff and so our staff are being trained and I need to submit um, sign-in sheets of trainings and agendas to DESE um, and that will happen in June and then finally SE um, 30 and then the other piece which didn't come up here. SE 37 is related to our out of district placements, which we um, are fully um, approved on that. We have um, ongoing monitoring that we need to do that's related to individual students. So when the Department of Education was on site, they looked at certain student records and they identified students who were missing documentation. So the reason that saying it's not corrected is because there was an IEP meeting coming up and I need to provide them with documentation of that specific student so it's not information that would be public it's just information I need to provide them about the steps we're taking with a specific student um, that they were looking at um, and then the final piece is related to our summary of student performance so we when a student turns 22 or they graduate we provide a summary of student performance it's just a document that's sent to students about um, their overall performance some accommodations they might need moving forward either in college or the workplace it's something that's sent out to the parents part of the last progress reporting period so we didn't weren't able to provide that corrective action because graduation hasn't happened yet so again those will be submitted in the June progress report so as I said this is kind of a snapshot so there'll be one more progress report um, and in my conversation with the Department of Ed it seems that once we have that last progress report submitted with those documents we should be all set um, no concerns on that end um, in regards to as I said the training of our staff on compensatory services training on the summary of student performance and we have to do our file our file review so I review student records in the areas identified and then we submit to the Department of Education by June 8th so all of that should be will be submitted to them um, the OCR just to follow up on compensatory services um, earlier in the year we talked about some additional um, complaints that have been filed we have heard nothing from the Office for Civil Rights since those complaints were filed we've done what we have needed to on our part and we've had no communication they haven't reached out to us um, for follow-up um, so I don't have anything else to report to you on that um, compensatory services we are working with our families and we're implementing the majority of those there are some that have requested the services during extended school year and we're working on accommodating this our extended school year doesn't start till July 9th um, and at this time we have no additional documentation required to be submitted to the Office for Civil Rights on that complaint as I reported out to you in, no, in the last report we had given them enough documentation and the only reporting requirement is if for some reason we're moving the classrooms at Joshua Eaton for the bridge program which we have no intent on moving those so there's nothing 
else required uh, for submission on that at this point. So questions on those two items. So on just back to the the mid cycle, the first slide. Yes. Uh, so can you just give an example of uh, you know, I know you, we can't talk about a specific yeah. case, but just an example of what, where we're lacking, where we need com to offer compensatory services. So what we actually do to track compensatory services is that our service providers, our special educators, our speech and language, occupational therapists, all our service providers, submit their schedules at the end of a week or the end of a cycle to the team chair. They indicate on that schedule if for some reason they missed a service. So if they were in attendance at a meeting not related to the student involved, if they were absent, or they were sick. Um, and we have to track those according to the Department of Education. And if it's a denial of FAPE, a student's free appropriate public education, we're required to provide compensatory services. So we track to see if there's a pattern. And what we've worked with the department on is that we really need to look at that over a one month period. Because there's often times that service providers may miss a service, let's say on a Tuesday of one week, but then the following week they have the ability to make up that service. So they document on the schedules they submit to the team chairs. Let's say I missed a service with Nick, you know, today, but then on Friday I had the chance to make it up and see him during another time. So there's no compensatory services because we've already made up for that. So it's when there's significant um, time that we've missed or maybe a student's IEP is signed and we weren't able to get the teacher's schedule in place for two weeks, then we owe compensatory services. So do we have, you mentioned the team, do, do we have one single gatekeeper for Every that? building has, it goes through the team chair. Okay, and on the, uh, you mentioned the out of district placements too. Is there a, I know we, we talked with the Walker report mm -hmm. way back, uh, that we needed someone to monitor those. Mm -hmm. Who's doing that? So, out of district place, out of district students placed out of district. We distribute um, those to each team chair. That's our current model because, as you recall, we we reduced a team chair position, which was our out of district coordinator. So, we've distributed out of district to each team chair and myself. I also I monitor three out of district cases. So, what we have done this year is, with the help of Kelly Boswick, we have kind of put in place a. Um, a monitoring system. It's not the best, but where we're, we have a system in place of monitoring, ensuring that IEPs are going out, ensuring that all the required paperwork, because there's some additional requirements for out of district, we need to monitor those students. We need to go on site and do observations of those students and have documentation of the monitoring in their file. Part of the role of the assistant director, when that position is onboarded, will be to do a more comprehensive monitoring of our out of district placements and how those are assigned. I will say um, there have been a lot of benefits to the shift in our model, including the fact that our team chairs who are, are taking care of our out of district families are very connected with our in district programs. And so it has helped us to have some conversation with families about what we have to offer in district. Because some families are just not familiar. Their child has been out of district for a long period of time. They may not be familiar with our in district programs. So we've been able to have some really good conversations with families. And the timelines and the monitoring have improved greatly um, since we have shifted to moving out of district students onto the caseload of our team chairs. Um, I think some of the, the more challenging pieces are just it does take time. It pulls people out of the district. Um, we also, and I kind of credit Kelly who's sitting there, she worked um, to put together the evaluation schedule. So students who are out of district also are um, get reevaluated every three years. So we, so Kelly really put together a um, schedule that use our in-district personnel to complete those evaluations. Again, that can be very challenging because it may require our staff to travel to the out-of-district placement to conduct that testing of the students. So, so do you envision the assistant director taking that rather than uh, it delegating it out? No, they'll definitely still be delegating it out, but they'll be monitoring how those those cases are assigned and ensuring there's a good balance. 
that's been this was our first go at it and I think <coughs> that we did our best to give kind of an equitable distribution of cases to team chairs but in reflecting on it we're seeing that there are other factors that need to be taken into consideration when we make when we assign an out of district case to a team chair so there's just things we've learned from this year that might change a little bit um, the assignments that we do yes I just had some background questions on this slide yeah. as well um, first just to pick up the storyline because it's certainly one we Mm -hmm. intersect with intermittently yeah. right in, in this form so we haven't heard for a while yeah. since March so as as I understand as I'm listening to your presentation in my mind correct me if I'm wrong here mm -hmm. there's three layers to this there's the broadest layer we have to continue to follow the law we have 700 some IEPs mm -hmm. we need all those requirements for all our students that's always going on yeah. in the background here. yes right. Secondly, there's a layer of oversight, and I think this one is the, there are two layers of oversight on top of that that mm -hmm. we have to comply with be, as a result of things that have happened in the past. One is Massachusetts state government, and that's yes. this. Yes, that's Massachusetts Department of Ed. And the second is the federal government, mm -hmm. which is the OCR, which is yes. the last slide before yeah. your question mark. Okay. So these are Massachusetts state requirements. SE 22, you said partially approved, and I, I tried to yep. follow, but, but I did not succeed in understanding yep, what is part, sure. what is partially yep. not approved. Um, so so help, help us understand yep, what that sure, is absolutely. and what the deadline is to get that approved. So that's the June 8th deadline. Um, so what we were struggling with, if you recall, was the language around the compensatory services and what was going to be our process for determining when we have an obligation to provide compensatory services. And we, I had worked closely with our liaison from the Department of Education to come up with language that would really work um, on both ends in meeting that requirement and also based on what we do day in and day out. So we were able to get the language of our process, so just kind of the steps we're going to take as a district approved. And so now that that's approved, we need to roll that out with staff and train all of our staff on it. So what we are doing between now and June 8th is we are reviewing with the special education teachers and service providers what the <coughs> expectations are around compensatory services. We will have agendas and we will have sign-in sheets that will then, on June 8th, be uploaded um, and reported to the Department of Education. And that's the step of compliance. And then in addition, I will do a file review. So I mentioned a file review. So I need to review student records in these areas. So I pull a sampling of students and I um, need to report to them the, that the elements were in the student record. A couple sure. follow so two, two follow-up questions. Um, is the language of the approved process publicly available to parents or no? Can it be? Uh, the language of the process. If parents were interested. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, it's a, it's a document that we have. So through a public information request that, you know, absolutely. Could we make that available um, on the website? If people yeah, I mean, we could absolutely make it available. I mean, I think I just caution that it's a procedure for us internally. It's not a request from parents. So it's not something a parent can request. It's more our internal monitoring process. So I'll just have to think I may need to put a cover letter to explain that a little more because it's really describing our internal process. Well, if, to the extent that parents are members of the public yeah. um, and it's yeah. a public process, mm -hmm. then I think transparency is more helpful rather than less provided yeah. that it yeah. doesn't you know, yeah. run afoul of any anonymity yeah. that we need to maintain. No, nope, nope, there's students. nothing. No, I, I'm just trying to think of where. Um, have a think about sure. it. Yeah, you just, know, let us know. Yep, um, I, I agree. I've been thinking about that because I think, Mr. Bobbin, you mentioned that when we were originally going over that. So I agree. I'm just trying to think of kind yeah, of where well, to not, put not it and how we want to. Th the last time we discussed it, you didn't have it yet. Right. Now so that now you we have finally it, have can, it. So you, now you we can. can um, and maybe it's something at our CPAC meeting as well. I can roll out there as well. I, and, and then the, the second follow up I had was just could you remind us that there, there's. The OCR had compensatory services too, yes. right, for reading. Yes. So help us understand what compensatory services are required for mid-cycle review and why, and then mm -hmm. same thing for OCR. Yeah. So there's not a requirement for compensatory services through the mid-cycle review. There's not an individual requirement. Okay. What the Department of Ed was looking at through the mid-cycle review was our process for providing compensatory services when and if 
a student was not provided services as outlined on their IEP. I see. Were there any students that were identified by the state in the, in the file reviews that required compensatory no, services? No, there were no individual students required. They actually... In general, yeah. not specifically. No, they actually <laughs> said our process was um, over-identifying students for okay. compensatory services because our language was indicating when a student missed a service okay. and the requirement is when a, um, a service is missed because the service provider is not available. We were doing, our language was actually more inclusive and we were saying when a student misses a service regardless of whether it was a student being absent or the staff being absent. So that's where we were working to refine the language. Does that make sense? It does. That's um, right. So there was not an individual student or a group of students that the Department of Education saw that we were not providing services for, and we didn't have an obligation to provide compensatory services. We just need to have a process that's more in line with the requirements. Great. <coughs> um, I didn't go ahead. Yeah. No, it's okay. Jean had a question. Yes. It's a quick one. And I think I know the answer. So there's no update on the OCR. Is there any standard timeline in any sense, or is it really just a... We really left it to our legal counsel, so they're typically 180 days, but... Okay. Thank you. That's Thank always you. our hope. We'll hear something. Thank you. That was going to be mine. <laughs> Um, my question was in one of the OCRs, the question was about um, the wrong staff doing, serving, giving the services. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just wanted to ask that that's been looked at across the board to make sure that not just it's been corrected with that student, but also with any other IEPs mm -hmm. that require certain training mm -hmm. or teachers to be delivering the services has that been looked at is so that, that one of the ones that we hadn't heard back from no I think that, that was I don't think that was related to the original complaint but oh maybe it was the newer one that I was rereading right so if that was just an allegation we really haven't no it wasn't it was it was the original yeah it was in the IEP that a trained SPED teacher was supposed to be delivering the services. Oh, yes. We have but that's it part was of the compensatory yep, That's part that of the delivering. piece we're doing around the compensatory services. By staff submitting their schedules at the end of the week or the end of the cycle. So remember, some of our, our middle school and high school are on a different <coughs> cycle, either the six day or seven day. So those service providers submit their schedules at the end of a cycle. That allows us to more closely monitor who's implementing those services. So yes, you are correct. We have looked at that. I thought you were talking about a methodology. I am sorry. No. You're talking about the type of person. Yes. Yes, yes sorry, we have done that thank work. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure I was following what you were asking. So. Any thank other? you. Yes. No other questions on the OCR complaint? Mm -hmm. um, so Again, there were there were two OCR stu students that filed complaints, and mm -hmm. some of the allegations of those complaints were upheld by the OCR, which mm -hmm. led to additional oversight, yeah. which is compensatory services to I can't remember. It was around a dozen students. Yes. yes. Right? How many of those students have have we reached out to all of those students yes. at this point? Yes. And and have we for those who. Uh, will be receiving compensatory services. Are they all receiving them on schedule? Is there anything we anything you want to update us on about implementing um, that? As I said, services? we are um, we're moving forward. Fam we've worked with families on individual schedules, and we're tracking those um, implementations. Some of them will be happening this summer. So there are a few families who've opted to have services provided in the summer. So at this point, we are on track. Um, you know, we've had some hiccups. You know, but we're working through those with each individual family, and if we need to extend the timeline we will we'll do that with families so and secondly did, have there been any more OCR filings since the March deadline that you haven't, haven't told the committee about no no nope. okay and the ones that are pending are still pending still as pending of today yep okay all right so next I want to go through a little bit of um, 
um, some of our data. So I wanted to just share with you a little bit um, on our teaching staff. So this gives you a snapshot of our special ed teachers, our related service staff. And then the last bullet, and I had gone over this, I actually went back to my presentation to you all in, from 2016, just to kind of compare. We have seen an increase in our um, special education teaching staff, our preschool teachers. We also, as you recall this year, increased our speech and language at the high school. Um, as you'll see from the list of contracted services, we provide a lot of specialized services through consultation, um, through various service providers. So these are all different services that we provide um, as a district. Um, I wanted to show this information. So this is our special ed teachers trained in specialized reading programs. This was our data from 2016. So if you go back to the presentation I did in, I think it was May of 2016, I pulled this. This shows you the different areas. So the, the lightest green and on the far left is Orton-Gillingham. Then the next green would be Wilson. Then we have Lips. Seeing Stars and Project Read. So that those were the number of teachers at each level trained in those um, different specialized reading programs. So this was 2016. This is 2018. This is our current slide. So what you can see, so I'm going to go back. I want you to take a look. This is 2016. So you see at our high school, we really had no one trained. We just had two teachers trained in Project Read. Um, and then when you look at our current, this is our current showing. So we have really looked, if you can see, across the board at all levels, we've worked really hard to diversify the type of programs that our teachers are trained in. We are not just focusing on Wilson language. We are, we are really looking at all different programs and identifying if there are gaps in a particular school, then we are looking to train. Sometimes we have gaps because someone may leave, and so that requires us to look at training somebody new in a building, and so we do a lot of that work. But it gives you a sense that across the district, we really are um, working to um, train our staff in all different reading programs, not just one reading program, because we know that our students who need specialized reading need different things. And these are just a few of the um, more popular reading programs. We also have teachers trained in just words. We use a PECS communication system. I mean, there's a lot of other things we train in, but this, these are kind of the most in-demand reading programs, and so I just wanted to give you that snapshot to show kind of the progress we've made in that area. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Are you open for questions? We, uh, we're, ju we're just kind of ju in between each, so this is a section. I think it's just a couple, two Can we slides. we as they're going on, though, so we don't forget? We're going to come, we'll be, the, what's this, like two slides, and then we come back to the, we, we Well, this we one has a lot more, because it's a lot of data, but. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Can you come up and. I have ADHD, so I apologize. That's all right. You mind, come, sure. you mind come, you mind come. You want me to uh, yeah. sit down? It doesn't matter. Just so the, the public can hear your question. Oh, I didn't I, know we were on camera. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Andy Murphy. Do you want my address? Uh, yes. 102 Johnson Woods Drive. Um, I, oh, back on the slide. So are you suggesting that, um, and again, I'll, I'll apologize in advance and um, appreciate your um, help. So early intervention at the elementary level, are you suggesting that over time you've reduced the number of teachers in early intervention for OG and Wilson. If I see the number of teachers, it's at the elementary level, it's gone down. We decreased our OG, I mean our Wilson, but that's from staff turnover. But you'll see we have increased our Wilson and LIPS training as well as seeing stars. Okay, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with LIPS. I'm sorry. Can you explain what that is? Yep, it's um, the Linda Mood Bell oh, okay. Um, okay, program okay. on phonemic awareness. My next question is: at the high school level, does that reflect a total number of seven teachers, or am I? So some of them might have training. Cross, in, yep, they might so have how many training, total so teachers are represented at the high school level? I don't know that offhand because I don't have. 
I don't have that data in front of me. You can't tell me how many teachers at the high school level? Why well, I, I don't want to miss in SPED. How many teachers total in special ed? There's thirteen. Well, it's thirteen. Thirteen special educators in at the high school for special education. Okay, and so of the thirteen, can you categorize each one of those thirteen in each of those disciplines? OG Wilson Lips. Can it? Can you out? Can you explain, like, what are you looking, of those 13, like... Yeah, you're saying you have 13 SPED teachers at the high school level? Yes, yes. Yeah. One is certified OG. Yeah. One Wilson. Yes. Two LIPS. The two LIPS? One, one. Scene Star and two Project Reads. Mm hmm Is that four teachers across five disciplines? Is it... I, I, I would say it's approximately four teachers. Four but teachers I don't know. Total out of, out of the thirteen are certified in those disciplines. Yes. That's uh, that's just you said certified. Uh, yeah, yeah, certified. We yeah. say trained. I wanna know exactly who's yeah. certified. Wilson is trained and OG is trained. How many oh, no, so, no, no, sorry, sorry, I apologize. Wilson and OG are the ones who are certified. So this only represents for Wilson and OG those who are certified. Is that one programs. person certified OG and yes. Wilson? One person certified in Orton-Gillingham and a different person is certified in Wilson. So two two separate yes. individuals. Two separate individuals. What about LIPS? Can we? Can LIPS is training. Can slide that just has certified Certified teachers, I'm sorry, Warren, but I'm sure. Certified teachers, because LIPS, I mean, because trained means nothing to most of the parents. I, mean, I apologize. Um, so when I put Wilson, I apologize. I meant people who had gone through Wilson and have the certification. I would not put them out of, yeah, an OG the if they've gone through that. LIPS is a two-day training. It's for those people who have that. It's not a two-day training. That's what they provide. So you don't have anybody that's trained in LIPS? I mean, that's certified in LIPS. There's not a certification for LIPS. If there were a certification, the entire, the there's, not, there's not a certification. It is a, it is a three-day training that they offer. And that's what we send our staff to. Yeah. So that's what's offered through Linda Bell. Can you say? So, so we're, so we're educating at the high school level, SPED students with teachers who have 20 to 30 hours of total training in a particular discipline and expecting that to be adequate. Are you talking about the LIPS program? We go through what Linda Mood Bell offers for that training. So our staff go through that training. That's what's offered by Linda Mood Bell. All right, so walk me through that. I've never gone through the training, so I really can't speak to that, Mr. Murphy. I'd be happy to have one of our teachers come back and talk about it, though. I mean, it sounds like that's something. Those this is under your offering. oversight, though. Yes, and that's what they offer through um, Linda Mood Bell. So, okay. So there's 30 hours of Linda Mood Bell training that we're relying on teaching an entire community of high school SPED students. Um, it's for those students who require that type of intervention. So okay. it's not for an entire the entire high school. Okay. And OG is the one teacher for OG, the one teacher for Wilson are both certified in yes. both of those disciplines. Yes, and we have copies of those, so if people would like particular, those can be requested <coughs> through me, and I have provided those to the parents who have requested. This is probably contained somewhere else, and I'll, again, I'll apologize for my ignorance. How many SPED students do we have at the high school level um, on a parent-teacher ratio, a parent-student ratio for the students requiring OG and Wilson instruction? I don't have that. Give me a guess. I really. How I'd many SPED students do we have at the high school? I'd have to look that up. I don't have it. Yeah, we don't have that. I don't. Have you don't know how many SPED students you have at the high school? It's a moving number. I don't have it with me right now. I'm happy to look that up. I just. It's not a big have. number. 
Well, what, what's the purpose of the question? Is it relative to this? Or? Yeah, I just want to understand the parent the student teacher ratio, yeah? I can find the information. I just need a minute to look it up. Go ahead. Okay. I have the time. Yes. I think is what you're trying to get at not how many students are on an IEP at the high school, because the majority of those won't need these services. These are very specialized services for a very particular kind of disability. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like what you want to get at is not really how many students are on an IEP at the high school, but how many students at the high school on an I IEP. I didn't ask how many students are on an IEP. I said how many SPED students require these services. That's what, I, from that's a, from what I'm trying to clarify. student ratio. So at the high school, it's correct. not how many SPED students we have. That's it's correct. how many students need these services. Yes, okay, I just wanted to make sure mm -hmm. I understood your question. Yeah. So currently, students at our high school, there are 13 students in the bridge program who potentially require that service. And then there are probably five to six other students. But I don't have their IEPs. I'm just giving you a raw number. So, and that could be a variety. That could be, I, I you know, the may not be that they require a full program, but I'm <coughs> pulling out the students that you're asking who okay. most likely. So that's 13 students across 9 through 12, currently. That are in the bridge full time? They're in bridge per, at some, in some capacity. I don't have their IEPs in front of me, so I can't give you mm -hmm. the specific amount of time that they're in the bridge program mm -hmm. and they're in bridge. <coughs> We have 13 students who are accounted for as in our bridge program, and those are the students who most um, frequently access those reading services. And what's the expectation for the, that same number of students in the next calendar year? How many students are we anticipating? And is that what you're asking next Correct. year? We are anticipating the same number. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm just wondering, can I offer some paper so that it's not frustrating when we wait to ask our questions? I mean, that's what I use my paper for, is to write questions that are coming up. And I'm glad to give you a pen and paper so that you make sure that your questions are addressed, but that we can let our presenter continue yeah, with her well, flow. I have an opportunity to ask a question. I took advantage of that, so I appreciate it. Yeah. I'll hold my questions till the end. Thank you. All right, so the next area I wanted to look at for you was um, our placement of our students. So this is looking at a category of students for our three to five year olds. Uh, at this time, the majority of those students are those located at the RISE preschool. So you'll see that seven of our students are in the inclusion setting for 50% or less. Um, 28 students in the inclusion setting the majority of the time, seven students in the inclusion setting the majority of the time. So they categorize for early childhood students who come for 10 hours or more or 10 hours or less. So have, this is DESI requirements. This is not a Reading requirement. So I'm just trying to capture this for you, but that we have 14 students in substantially separate classrooms. And then we have students who come in for related services only in preschool. Um, so we have students who may qualify for special education, just OT, just PT, just speech. Um, in our, for our 6 to 21 year olds, um, full inclusion is 492 of our students, partial inclusion is 96, substantially separate 27, and out of district is 67 students. So this gives you a sense of where are our students, where are the majority of our students, what type of settings are they in. So currently, um, based on our March reporting date, so I just wanted to share with you, we have 741 students on active IEPs. This is a change from our October 1 day, which was 724. As we've talked about before, that is always a, a moving target. So we do have an increase of 17 students. Um, that was in March. So from March to now, we may have an increase as well. But I just think it's important um, to kind of show the that that's changing. The types of dif disabilities, the majority of 
our students um, fall into the category of specific learning disability, it's approximately 27% of our um, students with disabilities are found eligible under that category. Our second highest is health, which is generally students who have ADHD. Our third highest is neurological, fourth highest is emotional, and the fifth highest is autism. Approximately 11% of students eligible for special education are um, students diagnosed with autism. Approximately, um, I wanted to look at the RISE preschool in particular because I think as we've shared with you, we've seen an increase in the number of students we're servicing, but also in the severity of the needs of those students. So approximately 20% of the students that we're serving at RISE preschool are diagnosed with autism. And that's where, um, as you remember, we did add another class from there. The smallest population for students we serve are deaf and hard of hearing and vision impairment as primary disability. And just to remind you all that when we are talking about disabilities, when we talk about these areas, they're based on IDEA um, disabilities. So these are the definitions, the federal definitions. They're not definitions that we create or the clinical de definitions. Um, so the next piece I wanted to look at was just share some of our data. This is the data that um, I don't think is the most accurate, but it shows us our number of parent referrals um, as of May 18th. So if you look each school, the, the dark green is the number of parent referrals, and then the light green shows how many of those parent referrals were found eligible. We are in the process of evaluating a number of students right now, so I'll have more accurate, to be honest with you, we'll have more accurate information in September. And the reason why is that when we receive um, evaluation consent forms and there's less than 30 days of school left, we won't meet on those students until the fall. So we won't have the results of those eligibility until the fall. Um, uh, for those students. So you see that we have this year had an increase, and this is what I'll talk about in some of my goals. We've had an increase, and I've talked with the CPAC about this in, in parent um, requests for um, special education evaluation. So across the board, we've seen a significant increase um, in requests for evaluation, and some of those are resulting in students being identified, and some are not. So this is across um, the five elementary, middle, and high school and then I wanted to show you RISE separately because again I wanted to share with you and remind you that we do have a child find obligation and our obligation is to identify students with disabilities and intervene with them as early as possible and so you'll see here that we have received a lot of parent referrals for RISE preschool and we are finding students eligible um, and this number doesn't even include that's a low number. that's a low estimate according to Ms. Boswick so um, we are continuing to identify students for Rise Preschool and we also receive referrals from early intervention as well and work closely with early intervention. So I just want to share with the committee that we are we're trending upward in this area. Um, I did put some notes in here that um, many of our parent evaluations in the district are still in process, so the numbers eligible should rise. Um, so we'll potentially see an increase. We've seen a higher number of referrals at Rise Preschool, and not only um, are the students being identified for services, but they're actually requiring um, services within our integrated preschool. And we do have a child find <coughs> obligation. Um, this is really to take a look and show you some of the um, our rejections. So how we process when we have a parent that rejects um, all of the IEP uh, placement or a partial rejection, we record that information and all rejections are sent sent to the state. So this just just to capture um, the 1415, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, and then from September 1st to right now, the number of rejections that my office has processed, the total number of students, and then the number of um, repeats. So you'll see that we have, on average, um, we have about 116 rejections that we process per year. Um, parents can have the right to reject the IEP in full, the placement in full, the IEP and the placement, or parts of that. 
We also report an IEP that's been unsigned for 60 days or longer as, report, as rejected. So though that data reflects all of those possibilities. So when you look at it, approximately 12.5% of our parents reject the IEP in some part. It could be a service, it could be a statement, it could be extended school year, and that approximately 87.5% of our parents accept the IEP in full. During 16-17, we saw the highest number of rejections and the highest number of students impacted by those rejections. We averaged around 116 rejections per school year, and we do send all rejections to the state, so that's tracked um, by the state, because um, that's our requirement. So I know that we're holding questions, but just clarify one term. Yep. When you say rejections, you mean the family rejects yes. the IEPs, yeah. not that the district nope. rejects this it. Is okay. totally just want to make sure yep. I'm understanding what you're saying. Yep. Thank you. Um, so then we've had a parent survey um, that's been available. We, um, did I miss a slide? No. No, okay. So the parent survey is located on the student services website. It is included in the signature of my email and the email of all the team chairs. That was a recommendation of the CPAC. Um, we put it in our N1 notices that we send to parents anytime there's IEP paperwork. So since March of 2017, we've received 27, 25 responses. Um, it is kind of, we don't get a lot of participation, although we, the only schools we haven't heard anything from are the high school in Killam. All other schools, we've had at least one response. And the most recent response was May 8th, which makes me think that people still know it's out there, so that is a good thing. Um, so in looking at it, we ask a number of different questions about whether parents feel they're an active member of the IEP process. Do they feel that their voices are heard? Are we explaining uh, the criteria? Um, do they feel we've um, incorporated the concerns and vision? Um, so it's important to note that I did put in here that there's an option of yes or no, and then there's an other or an NA. So sometimes, like for instance, where it says 72% of parents felt the eligibility criteria were explained adequately, 8% reported no, and 20% said NA because maybe they were not doing eligibility at their child's meeting. So, um, so this is just some of the data that came out of the parent survey. I have, um, at different intervals, I have pulled kind of a summary of the data and shared that with team chairs. Um, one question that we've had really mixed results on and we need to discuss with the CPAC whether or not we want to change the question or <coughs> is this one question? Um, and there were only two comments provided that are, were very, seemed very specific to that individual case. They don't really give us much insight into the trend of why are we kind of 50-50. It doesn't seem to, um, it doesn't seem to help us. So it's a, it's a question we need to revisit and determine if it's giving us the information we want or is there another way to ask that question about what happens when you disagree. Um, there is a spot on the survey to recognize staff, which is really nice, and parents also often take the time, and I send out an email to those staff and the principal when we do get that to let them know. If the parent shares their name, I say who the parent is. If they didn't, I just thank them for doing such a great job in servicing our students. I think it's always nice to recognize the staff who are working really hard on a child's team. We also have a section for other comments, and if they are related to a specific building, I review the comments with the team chair and the building administrator. And, um, and then also there are sometimes comments that are helpful for all team chairs. Um, the most recent one we got was um, feedback that really part of the comment was very related to all the team chairs to take into consideration. So I will redact any personal information and I send that to all the team chairs and say this was what we received in parent feedback. I'd like us to talk about it and reflect on our practices and see if there's something we need to do differently. So we review that. If a parent does leave their name, I will often reach out if they want us and see if they want to talk about, if they had a concern they identified, if they don't leave a name. It's hard, I can't really follow up, but if, you know, some families do leave a name and, you know, ask to speak, so I'm happy to follow up. I kind of check it usually 
every two months. Because it's not a very active survey, I check it, you know, periodically. It's not something I look at every week because we don't get that frequent of responses. Um, so what does our data tell us? Um, we continue to increase the number of special ed teachers on our staff in order to provide specially designed instruction. We increased our preschool needs. We have added teachers at Killam this year. We have seen an increase in the need of our students. We are looking at continuing to increase the number of teachers across all levels who have training or certification in specialized reading programs. Our referrals to special education are not going down. We're seeing an increase. Um, we need to continue to think about how to engage with families and ensure we are getting their feedback. So the survey really isn't an effective way at this point for us to get that feedback. So we are continuing to think of how do we gather parent feedback. And just for the committee to know, we used to have a paper survey that was sent home and the, the feedback from the CPAC was to try this electronic survey and so that's the route we have gone. We took the same questions. Um, the paper survey we probably got five to six returned a year. So this is an increase but it's still not representative of the majority of our families um, and their experience. And that's really our goal. We're looking for that feedback to really ensure that families feel they're an active part of the team process. All right. So Carol went on, like, the slides aren't numbered, but the, the action plan A slide, closing the achievement yeah. gap, and the, uh, we saw the highest number of rejections to the yeah. uh, background on that and why that's the okay. case. Um, I don't know that I have a sense of why. I think it is worth, like, when looking at it like this, it gives us a good, you know, it's a good opportunity to do some root cause. Last year was, and I think you all know, was a pretty active year for us in terms of um, the special education process. We saw an increase, as you all know, in our out-of-district placements, which this is probably, an in, you know, reflective of that component. Um, having looked back over a lot of those cases, there's not one program that we can really point to. Um, what I will say, one, one area that I think we continue to struggle with is transition age. And so what I mean is from fifth to sixth, eighth to ninth, those seem to be the years where we're having more rejections or more concerns. Um, kind of across the board. I wouldn't say it's you know one program specific. So I don't know uh, whether this is the right point yeah. in the presentation, but a question I have, and it's not for tonight, yeah. but it, and maybe Dr. Daugherty be involved too, what point do we just take a look at the, all the programs we have? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I know what our goals are is is, mm -hmm. is keeping the kids in in the district and inclusion and all. But we we have to do that right. And if there's if we're falling short in areas because of staffing or what is it is it a time when maybe there's a program we can't do or, or to, I mean when do we make, do have that kind of top down look at all the programs? Uh, how frequent will that be or and again, that's maybe yeah. not an answer, yeah. for ten, but I think that's yeah. something we need to do. Because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I first got on the school committee, I think there was maybe two programs in the district at the time. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, what are we up to? Seven or eight? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, and I know why we're growing them, and, and I'm not against that, but I want to make sure we're Yep. we can handle what we have. Yep. Uh, so, anyway. Yes. I can let someone else go first. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, just a quick clarification. On the yep. slide, placement ages 6 to 21, where you yes. break up full inclusion, yep. partial inclusion. So am I doing this right that if you add those all together, you should get the total number? So you, should, you could calculate a percent that way? The total so total number of, of students who no. that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. You're not going to get to the seven, the 700. Yeah. No, because okay. that it has, you have um, that six to 21. You need to add in the three to five. Okay. 
because our total number includes everyone. Gotcha. Do you see what I'm saying? It includes out of district, everyone in district, plus our three to five year olds. But if I wanted to figure out what I'm trying to get at is yep. what's the percentage yes. fully included. Yep. I'm stinging. You can do the yeah. add these divide. Yes. Okay. Does that okay. make sense? But you have to include all of them because yes, it's the, whole the full count is everyone. Total. May I ask one more? Sure. On the next slide, the, um, the breakup by student yes. referral. So Joshua Eaton jumps off at the page. Yes. It's right. the largest elementary at Eaton Killen. Is that part of the reason? that Because this isn't a percentage, it's a right. number. It's so you'd number. expect the number yeah. to be a little bigger. Is that what's driving it, or uh, do you think there's no, something No, I think that there are a lot, there are concerns that are happening that are resulting in more requests for referrals. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've seen an increase. Every time there is also a report card or a reporting period, you'll also see a spike. Okay. Thank you. So, I guess. Yes. Um, so what are we doing with that data? I'm going to talk about that. In okay, that's session. coming up. You're right. I have a, a plan exactly. of things I'm thinking about. So. Okay. And I just then, wanted you to get a picture. And then I, I um, apologize if I've missed something, but one of the slides... Um, Right after the charts about the numbers yep. of um, teachers trained yep. and certified, yep. placement for ages three to five years old is the yes. title of the slide. Yep. So the one, two, three, the, so the second bullet yep. says majority of the time. Yep. Then the third bullet says majority of yes. the time. Should that say minority? Nope. The, so no. you have okay, kids who are 10 hours or more. Yep. And then you have 10 hours or less because in preschool they can come for a variety of different okay. program options. Okay. So in preschool it's not like kindergarten you just come, you know, or first grade. They could be in a three, three half day program. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's the distinction there. Is there any uh, question? Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, Caroline, yes. first of all, thank you for putting this together. You put, pulled a lot of data together mm -hmm. here, and we're appreciative of that. I'm sure that wasn't a, a short process for you. Um, I still have three serious concerns, yeah, abiding absolutely. concerns, yeah. after, uh, after what I've seen and heard. And I'll put them in three buckets, yeah. like I like to do most mm -hmm. of the time. Bucket one is, I want to see more demonstrated student improvement, as reported by parents, as reported by behavioral, mm -hmm. Referrals, what, however you can assess the well-being yep. of a child holistically, I want to see evidence that these programs and these interventions are right. improving yep. child outcomes. Yep. Okay. And I want to see that from the child side, I want to see it from the administration side, and I want to see it from the parental survey side. Mm -hmm. I want to know from parents, because all of the questions in the survey, on your parental survey, I noticed that none of them and maybe there are more questions, but none of the ones you highlighted here say, is your child, are you happy with the services your child is receiving? Is it actually improving your child's education? So we focus on the IEP team meeting process, but I think that's a good point, and we can talk about, and actually Sarah and I had talked about um, some different surveying that we may want to do through the CPAC to gather some different input from parents. So we actually, was it last week we talked? We just talked about kind of how to survey and, and what we might want to gather for information. So I think you make a good point and I should have clarified that the purpose of that survey was really to gather information on the IEP team process, like on the meeting. But I think I like that idea and, and Sarah and I are, are yeah, I think thinking. we talked about maybe coming from CPAC parents might be a little more comfortable sharing um, and, and keeping it simple to mm -hmm. what has worked well, what mm -hmm. maybe hasn't worked as well, and trying not to ask too many identifiers, enough identifiers that we can kind of understand mm -hmm. areas of need, but mm -hmm. not enough that parents would feel uncomfortable sharing. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Anonymous is fine. So one thing I noticed is there's two consecutive slides here on this point on the, on the amount of information mm -hmm. you're demonstrating here from parents. It's very low. Yes. Right? It's very low. Mm -hmm. yep. And so what, what hit me immediately was if I do the approximate that you say 12% of parents rejected IEPs, right? And then you two bullet points, you say, we average 116 rejections per year. Well, do the math, you're over 1,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So over 1,000 parents have responded to an IEP, yet only 25 of them have responded to the survey. Yes. That's like, you need a boatload of significant mm -hmm. figures to figure out even what yeah. percentage that is, yeah. right? So I would like to see goals yeah. of like 20% response yeah. rate from parents, things, things like that, so that I want you to know from parents what's yeah. 
not just the process, but what's working for their children, which is what we're all about. Two other buckets, yeah. so switching gears. Um, per pupil analysis of resources, I want to see that. So what I saw in these slides is the supply side, I'll call it, but not the demand side. And what I mean by that is these are the resources you're putting into the school system. Mm -hmm. These are the FTEs, these are the trainings, this is the, our time and treasure that we're investing in these students through the adults mm -hmm. and through the curriculum, presumably. And I want to know the other side of it, and, you know, not just identifying, and it is helpful to know how many children are in an inclusion, partial, mm -hmm. full inclusion, and, uh, but I, I want to see if there's an achievement gap, you know, I, I want to tie everything back to where that gap came from. How was that gap first identified, and are we chipping away at it with these processes and procedures, recognizing that this is not a short and easy process and will take multiple years, I would expect. Mm -hmm. But I, I, want to, I want everything to come back to that source of student outcomes, mm -hmm. right? however, in, in every way, including test scores, but not excluding everything else. Uh, and then the, the last thing, is could we get, so, so oh, I'm sorry on that point. So in, in, your, in your slide where you had the number of trained teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to understand and benchmark to teach the robustness of the teacher training, right? So is the training, it's not a binary trained, not trained, it's how are we doing on enabling our teachers to meet the needs of our students mm -hmm. as validated outside of Reading? So there were mm -hmm. two of those, I think five, trainings that have an external validation or certification, yep. presumably. Yep. So that means something mm. throughout Massachusetts and maybe throughout the country. But there are others that don't. And so it begs the question in my mind, do, do these teachers have enough training or as much training as they would in any other district in Massachusetts that would have students similarly positioned? And for a teacher training, how many, what's the student teacher ratio within that? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to look at a graph that says, well, we have one teacher in high school who has this particular certification. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Is that teacher expected to achieve outcomes with 13 students mm -hmm. or 130 students? Because mm -hmm. those are very different yeah. realities on the ground. And so it helps this committee to know, because we have to set budgets and prioritize every year, helps us to know what what our district looks like and what our students need, because it, it, with the presentation tonight, I just don't feel like I have yep. uh, that heavy information I need to assess yep. that. Um, so those were those yep. were my points. So That's great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, if, if I heard your slides right and your description right, we're seeing an increase in parent referrals. Yes. And it sounds like you're anticipating an increase in the number of students on IEPs next yes. year. So my question is twofold. One is, we usually monitor relative to peer districts our percentage of students mm -hmm. on IEPs, and we're always kind of in the middle. Yep. Are you now projecting that we're going to have maybe a higher percentage, or you don't think the difference is I don't think so, much? because we had been, we had been kind of trending yeah, that's down, true. We so I don't feel that we're going to so go So we're still going to be within sort yes. of a range that's yes. typical. That's good. Yes. I don't see us going up that yep. much higher than it's good. And my second question related is um, budget impact. Mm -hmm. As you're going through this process, I know you're working with Ms. Yep. Dowd to talk about what the costs are associated yes. and whether transfers are needed yep. and whatnot. Yes, we are looking at our staffing resources, where we need to allocate resources um, to meet the needs. Because as you can imagine, students are moving throughout our district. They're not just kind of staying where they are this year. They're moving to that next level or different experiences. So. Thank you. Mrs. Bennett, did you have a question? I just wanted to know, yeah, it's a lot that you have the um, teacher. Yes. Yeah. Do you have available sheet for the parents that has the name of the name of the teacher and what their certifications are, or if it's lives how many hours, if they keep the lawyer working what building they're in? I don't have a document. I did receive a request for that. I don't have a document like that. I have information on each individual teacher. So when parents request information on their child teacher or teacher they are anticipated to have, we do provide that information. I just don't have a document currently created that has that information. I think we should have that. I don't know why that's numerous times. When my son is in the LD program, I want to know who's available to him in high school if I have to fight to get him out of the high school because there's only one award to go him teacher. I need to know this information. And I need to know how long that person said lives training. Um, also, how do you determine the success of your program? For instance, um, the LD, my son, four of his peers have been out of the but he's almost the only one left. <coughs> and he's not making it. 
meaningful progress. So how do you determine that and when will you start looking at that to determine that? I'm going to talk about that in some of our next steps. And when, you, when we make the changes to fix it, because I don't see the beginning of that program being fixed, that start of that program changing all that much in Josh Wheaton to improve it. I see the same pattern that I saw when my son went through, so I don't see that. How? I'm going to. I'm going to just like expert. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to talk about some of that in the next section. So, so I don't. I don't think it's an unreasonable request yeah. to catalog. I don't know whether that's done through personnel or or, or people's. Uh, it's basically their resume, uh, right? I mean, that's what you're what you're looking for. Yeah, I've asked for people. We've asked for people. Okay. Before. I just don't have one for the whole district. So as I no, said, I, I know you don't have yeah. it. Now I'm saying yeah, that's absolutely. something yeah. we, we yeah. need to. So you'll commit to doing that? I will commit I think it's to, something we need talk to talk to about. staff yes. about doing. Absolutely. It's something we need to talk about. Well, why would we have to talk about that? Why would we I need to, to talk to Mrs. Wilson about it and more detail? When will you commit to having that? I'm sorry. Just so you know, I've asked asked before and we've gotten stonewall about it because we don't want to actually name the person who is certified or trained. I don't see it as being any different than saying, Mr. Smith, history teacher, grade 10. I don't understand why it's in the, in the, in the of course, like to see what you're him certified or mm -hmm. trained or this what's for lips weekend warrior or lips 20 hours of training you know i don't think that is unreasonable and as i just said i don't either so uh we'll oh, I, I have can, we, can we break through the log jam here can, can i please understand dr doherty what you need to talk to uh, i need to get more information before i can make a commitment it's as simple as that i don't want to make a commitment publicly until i know all the information is there a, a legal precedent that would prevent us from making that information public? We do not have that list available right now. It does not exist, which is why when there's a re records request, we can't provide it because it doesn't well, exist. What, but you have Mr. Murphy, we will. I, 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 I'm not gonna, I can't give you a date, date certain when I'll have that for you, but I'll, I'm making, the, yes, we'll make that commitment that we'll sit down and figure out how we can pull that data together, who we need to ask, in the district to get that information so that it's available. Is it? yeah, yes. and just one caveat with some legal review around what. That is why I cannot yeah. That's commit why anything the at this point. Yeah, I, I, I certainly. Asked that I, I, asked yeah. that yeah. I, I just think that when, when you but get to stuff get like this, we have attorneys for Right, I mean, yeah. we can. Yeah. I, I need more information before I can commit to anything. Yeah. That, that's, that's all I'm saying. I can't say anything else at this point because I don't know what the ramifications are. That's all I'm saying. But the, but the request has been made, it sounds like, the request has been made prior. It's made, been made as a public records request, which we don't have the information. We do not provide something if it doesn't exist with a public records request. But you know the educators that are involved and you understand their credentials. So when, when we have a parent request the credentials of the child, their teacher that they have, we provide those. Right. We provide those uh, frequently. I send those to our HR administration and we send letters to parents. So if there's a request made related to the teachers that your child has, we, we create a response to that. For a public information request, our obligation is to respond with a document if we have it. We don't have the document of all the teachers in the, I just don't have a document with all the teachers in the district with all that information. So that's, the, I think, the sticking point here. When a parent does reach out and ask for a specific teacher or teachers that their child may either have or currently has, we respond to those individual requests. From a public records request, we don't have a document that captures all the information that's being asked for. But I just this want you to understand why, and she, and if, I, if there's an individual teacher, she does give me that information. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I need further grades is because mm -hmm. if I need Orton Gillingham here, and I'm looking mm -hmm. for the next year, and they don't have an Orton Gillingham teacher, they're going to force me to Wilson. So I need to make other arrangements for my sure. son or try to fight for other arrangements or in ninth grade or in tenth grade. This is it's a constant battle. So 
we need to, other districts do it, I need to see the map, I need to see what we really have available. And we, we will uh, sit down and work to get that document so that it's something you can use. Yes. Carolyn, I, yeah. Ms. Wilson. So I wonder, I hear you saying, and, and this is the first time I've heard any of these yeah. points discussed, but as in my first impression, I, I, hear, I hear two positions, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's a third one to consider. Sure. So what I hear is if a, parents have a right to know who's educating their child, and mm -hmm. if there's a, a relevant uh, component of the teacher's training or expertise that relates to the child's academic needs, and they ask for that information, mm -hmm. they receive it. Yep. So that, I haven't heard anyone dispute that here today. Mm -hmm. this, the second um, thing that I hear is a request, as I understand it, to make publicly available all of the teachers with all of the relevant SPED certifications, who they are. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear. And, and what comes to mind is, is the continuity question that was just brought up mm -hmm. from Ms. Bennett about if a child is receiving services and has a, um, a particular expertise that their mm -hmm. child is receiving, and, and it may even be outside of SPED. Mm -hmm. it, it, I can't imagine what it would be, but it could be anything that's relevant mm -hmm. to their child's education. And, and the parent says, there, there's various points where we interact with our, as parents, with our teachers and with the administration about planning. Mm -hmm. And there's regular things. We do parent university, we do move up day at the end of the year, and then we do a bunch of things in between. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if at one of those points in between, there's parent-teacher conferences, there's a lot of opportunities to do something like this, where, where a student has an identified need or expertise in the parent. I'm just showing one example of a parent mm -hmm. identifying and saying, like, I want to make sure my child has access to that expertise next year. Mm -hmm. It could be an IEP meeting, mm -hmm. but I, I don't even think this is limited to IEPs, although mm -hmm. this, is, this is your expertise. So, but um, could, yeah. could foreign language, it could be, mm -hmm. thank you, it could, it could be an, any number of supports. Mm -hmm. So what I'm suggesting is, is a third option where we have some kind of continuity, I'll call it continuity mm -hmm. planning, where I, I don't know that the parent, it, it, this would be something to discuss, the, the, does the parent need to know which teacher it is? As I don't know that the parent needs to know that. The parent needs to know that there is a teacher available who has the certification that their mm -hmm. child is currently receiving, or there is a gap and there is no teacher mm -hmm. available. That to me seems something the parents should know early mm -hmm. in the process, probably okay. right at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Because you know your staffing and assuming right. there's no turnover, you say, look, we have, we have two teachers next year who have this certification, parent mm -hmm. X, and at the end of the year meeting, whatever that is, we'll let you know if, if we can place your child with one of those two, and if we can't, then here are your rights and here's the process around what you can do. I'd like to see something like that, where you have like an early identification of if your child gets certain expertise now and needs that, especially for an IEP, we can look ahead for you. We can't tell you which teacher is, but there are two teachers out of four who would have that certification or training. So that, that's a third Yes, path. and I agree, and that's a big piece of when you saw that chart is really diversifying and ensuring that at all levels we aren't just training in one program, which had been a concern when I came on board, that the only training we offered staff was Wilson. And so we're looking to expand that and also looking kind of at each level, that's why I broke it out at elementary, middle, high school, so you can sort of see going through there. The other thing just to share is that we do offer um, uh, transition um, open houses. So when students are coming from elementary to middle, we offer ones just for students with disabilities so parents can come in and talk, meet the staff. Um, and we also did this year for the first time the high school offered a um, open house for the bridge program for parents coming from eighth to ninth grade. They had an opportunity to observe a class, meet with the team chairs, um, and really learn about the program. So we are trying to think ahead to those pieces. We did run into a challenging situation when our speech pathologist at the high school resigned and we weren't able to fill that. Those are those kind of compensatory services and we, in times, and I think we spoke about this in the fall, we look to contract in as well. So if we don't have someone with that level of expertise, we have contracted, we've used Commonwealth Learning, we've used Linda Mood Bell to contract in to provide a service for one student or a group of students. So we app, that is a very good point and it is something that I'm always looking at, that, that kind of vertical alignment component. So to just to be clear, I'd go beyond that. Mm -hmm. I would I would go to a pro I'm suggesting a process where every parent on an IEP 
ha has a touch point, I'll call it, mm -hmm. with the administration that whatever services are being provided for that student, if it involves a certification or special accommodation, that as far as you know, as circumstances stand, if there's a gap, that will be identified to them as early as possible. And sometimes that, with these certifications, that may well happen, right? Mm -hmm. Where we don't have anybody in the Where next someone grade. may have left, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyone else? Oh, I got a lot. The, um, so, Ms. Wilson, I will say um, your um, opportunity to have a, a parents view the bridge program I, I, I would, uh, I don't know if you took a parent survey, but I would suggest that that was not well done. It did not show well. And if your intention was to demonstrate the benefits and advantages of the bridge program over other out of district opportunities or uh, programs, it, it, didn't, it did not go well. And I'm happy to share specifics with sure. you. Anyone else? All right, you ready to move on? So I wanted to go back through some of the areas from the Walker report um, that we had previously touched on because I don't want to lose sight of conversations we've had previously and say those are no longer relevant. Um, so one of the big areas, and we've talked about this through other meetings, is the MTSS structure and how we use data systems and practices. So the, the concern in the Walker report was that it was unclear whether we were using MTSS, SST, kind of all these acronyms, and what were we really doing? And so we've done a lot of work, and, I, and you've heard about a lot of the work that we've been doing. Um, this year we really are solidified that each um, building has a building leadership team that's looking at student data. We also have a district-wide data team that meets on a regular basis. We review data protocols with our district data coach, and we are ongoingly using our DCAP, our district curriculum accommodation plan. Next year, one of the big um, areas that has kind of been shining through is what are the um, essential elements of the SST or the student support teams um, and ensuring that each school has this process articulated for staff and parents. So um, in the Walker report, it was referred to as a pre-referral or SST. And so what I've had a lot of conversations with our district data coach about looking at the structures that we currently have every school has something a little bit different but ensuring that there are essential elements of that process and being able to be more transparent about this is how we do that at Barrows this is how we're doing that at um, Birch Meadow um, so that's a really important piece the other thing is this summer it really is time at this point for us to review our district curriculum accommodation plan and spend some time looking at those accommodations we've identified and ensuring that what we have in this document is reflective of our current practices so when this document was written it was actually before we had intervention blocks at every school so there are certain things that need to be revised in that process so and the reason I'm connecting that to MTSS just to remind people is that the DCAP our curriculum accommodation plan is our tier one and some of our tier two interventions so it really articulates those interventions that we have in place for all students and kind of aligns the tiers um, so I think that it's important at this point given where we're at that we revisit that <coughs> document and have some recommendations it doesn't need a full overhaul it really just needs to be looked at um, based on where we're at in our current practices um, administrative so there were lots of concerns through the locker report with the team chair role um, there were also concerns with clerical support a need for a procedure manual and the assistant director those were really key points that came out of that we have increased the total number of team chairs um, and we're um, increasing even more now and so we feel that that model is going to offer more stability in that position. Um, the clerical support continues to be an area we struggle with. Um, it wasn't, I don't, I think we've been pretty transparent that, you know, we don't, we're not heavy on the clerical support. We do our best with what we have, um, but it is an area that we continue to struggle with. 
Uh, the procedure manual, we have created documents that are used by our special education staff and they're available in our shared um, space. And they really um, identify our procedures for staff on what we do before a meeting, at a meeting, after a meeting. Um, additionally, we have a team chair binder that is a reference guide for each team chair. So it has important district forms in it. It has special education regulations. It has a lot of the information that each team chair needs. And I looked at Ms. Boswick, who actually created that. She organized all the information. And then we were able to also create an electronic format for that so it's easily shared. So it is providing not only some clarity around kind of our process, but it also is helping support new team chairs when they come into the district. We have this manual that they're able to utilize and it's pretty user friendly for them. Um, the assistant director position, as we've talked about, um, was an exciting part of the override. A big component of this position will be um, looking at our district programs and really supporting that work um, and really being able to spend time with the um, program PLCs, the professional learning communities, to help those teachers um, map out the work they need to do each year um, to increase their capacity, identify training needs, and plan for that. So we interviewed seven candidates. We've identified three for second round interviews. We did have second round interviews on this past Friday. We're in the process of vetting each of the candidates and we'll hopefully have a recommendation to the superintendent by Friday of this week for an assistant director. Um, program development. This year we, and this was an area through the Walker Report, we've had a lot of programs and lots of questions. So we continued this year with our vertical professional learning communities for special ed program teachers and learning center teachers. Um, this is a, a very positive opportunity for our teachers to meet from K to 12 in their programs. They value this time, they review their curriculum, they review student data, and um, the feedback is so positive um, and actually another piece of feedback that they provided to me Friday because some of them participated in the second round um, interviews is that they actually want to come together as um, curriculum leaders and spend more time as the leaders of those groups sharing practices. So that was really exciting to hear. Um, we continue to review program spaces, which was an area in the Walker Report and also our OCR complaint to ensure that there's compliance with federal and state laws. Um, and making sure our programs, not only is there space needs, um, some of our programs have very specialized equipment, furniture, and supplies and materials. So we are always reviewing those, looking at the different spaces, seeing what supplies and materials the population of students in our programs need and making sure we have those available. Um, we continue this year to have clinical supervision for our counseling staff. We use North Shore Consortium, one of our collaboratives. They send some of their um, counseling staff to provide clinical supervision. Um, a concern that had come out of the Walker Report was that our counseling staff, our school psychologists and our school counselors, didn't have clinical supervision, which is something you really need as you're working with really challenging families or students. And so this allows them to have that clinical supervision. It is not evaluative but more allows them to problem solve cases and, and gives them the support they need um, in their profession. The TSP program at Killam has improved the service delivery through increasing the staffing and implementation of a level system and they have some specific curriculum that they use to work with students with emotional disabilities. Um, we have refined what we call into as a program exploration process. So this is our process when a student is being referred to one of our programs. We have a specific exploration process that includes parents. Um, it includes observations of the student, a review of the current IEP and testing, <laughs> and then discussions at a team meeting about whether or not the student um, is, uh, is appropriate and requires the programming in a specific program. For next year, all programs, I've worked with the CPAC to identify the um, items that they, that parents would like and that, that we all agree would be good information to have for each program. So we're going to have a uniform format for each program that identifies the following areas. So it's gonna talk about the placement type. So is it uh, full inclusion, partial inclusion, substantially separate? 
a description of the population, identifying their cognitive profile, social, emotional, behavioral, the methodologies that are used in the program, expected goals for students within the program, and then tools for progress monitoring. So how do we monitor students' progress in that program? So our goals are to be able to have that for all programs by spring of 2019. Some programs are further along, and so as they are completed, we will be putting them on the student services website. So some of them may be up earlier. I'm not gonna wait till they're all done, mm -hmm. but as they become completed, um, one of the things I talked about with our um, teacher leaders um, who, are, who are leading that work is this is a good opportunity for them to identify some goals for their own PLC for next year. So if they haven't clearly identified tools for progress monitoring, that should be a focus of their work starting in the fall. <coughs> so. It's, a, it's going to be a standard form that each program will have and that will be placed on the website. Um, and then that will give us a place to, if that isn't enough information for families, we can then work to add more information, but at least it's uniform information. Um, as I said, we're going to continue the work in our PLCs. Our teachers really want to ensure that the time they have to meet together vertically is dedicated time. Sometimes this year, for different things that have been happening in the district, certain levels have been pulled out of that time. And the, special, the feedback I'm getting is they really want to <coughs> ensure that that is dedicated time. <coughs> Co-teaching. So we continue to work on supporting the model in all schools. Birch Meadow has a full day co-teaching model in the Connections program and in some of our other classrooms. We work with principals to discuss how co-teaching can happen and be using classroom walkthroughs. Um, when we're visiting classrooms, we talk about this. Um, one of the focuses at our secondary level they would like to do is look at differentiation and utilization of additional staff in the classroom. So that's going to be a focus of the work that both um, the middle schools and the high school would like to do. That's their starting point, they feel, before going into real co-teaching. <coughs> and then Birch Meadow will be focusing on increasing the capacity of all staff to work in the co-taught model and ensure there are inclusive practices. So every school is working on inclusive practices. I just wanted to highlight two things that have really been kind of identified by principals as a focus area. Professional development. So we've had limited funding. Um, we're using our grant funding. And so these are the things we've been able to do um, this year. We've continued working with Alan Bloom on IEP writing and goal writing. We made a commitment to that, I think, three years ago we started that. And so um, this year we used him just to train our new staff. Um, on the process because we feel if we're going to commit to this we need to at least for every new staff provide that. We've provided the following trainings. I think what's really important is we have done at Joshua Eaton what we made the decision to do with Mrs. Mrs. Ippolito joining us is to have um, her teachers participate in the landmark online course. So that was in January. It was an introduction to working with students with language-based <coughs> learning disabilities. It was our it was a way to efficiently and effectively provide an overview course. We don't feel that that is sufficient um, to build their capacity, but it was our starting point. It was our entry point. Now we're providing on-site coaching with Landmark. So we have three days this school year with Joshua Eaton and one day this year with um, the high school. So we're continuing our relationship with Landmark. We provided also for the Joshua Eaton special ed teachers, we had Melissa Orkin from Tufts University um, on the April 13th. Um, early release day before April vacation. Melissa came out and provided a training for those teachers on reading and reading interventions. <coughs> how does reading develop? And then how do you target interventions for different types of um, presentations? We had presentations from an outside psychologist on evaluation tools. We did an internal reading panel. We did some uh, writing of value um, of special ed evals using our own staff, math interventions with one of our staff. Um, RISE Preschool has really been focused on PBS. Um, this summer we'll be working on, we'll be sending some of our Parker and Joshua Eaton staff to training at the Landmark School through the outreach program. 
and then we our goal is at least one special ed teacher will be trained in the seeing stars program we do have a couple other teachers who have expressed an interest in training in a program called ravo so we are also looking at that again trying to diversify what we have to offer um, our students so that's another area we're looking at um, some of our goals for next year, as I said, is the RAVO, which is another specialized reading program. We have one elementary and one middle school teacher trained, but we'd like to offer more of that. Um, we are looking to support middle and high school in teaching executive functioning. That seems to be a really hot area of concern. And how are we doing that systematically? Our conversations actually are much broader, just to give you context, than just it, as a special ed service. We're really thinking about how do we integrate executive functioning in as a tier one um, support for all students through middle school and high school. So we've really begun that conversation. We're going to continue our coaching support for Joshua Eaton with Landmark School to provide them with regular coaching. And what that looks like is um, the outreach person from Landmark comes in and he typically spends a full day. He observes teachers and then provides them with direct feedback on their practices and then they set goals for the next time and he'll come back in six to eight weeks and do the same thing. <laughs> and it's a really effective model because it's not supervision and evaluation. It really is working with people to change their practices and internalize those practices they've learned about. We also are going to be looking at providing coaching and support for our Crossroads and Connections programs with Melissa Orkin and Ann Waters. They're both from Tufts. Um, and it's going to be on integration of language-based strategies into those programs. So the students in those programs have more complex cognitive profiles. And so our, we need some more support for our teachers on um, how to integrate some of those really good practices around language-based instruction into their work. We'll continue to send staff to the Mass Down Syndrome Congress. We're going to continue our work with Alan Broom. Um, and as I said, begin work on differentiated instruction. Other important work this year. We had Melissa Orkin from Tufts um, complete a program review of the Bridge Program at Parker. I, it, it will be, the final product will be here any day. So we are working with Melissa. She's a professor at Tufts. Um, and she has her own um, organization called Crafting Minds. We anticipate the report any day. Our goal will be to then review that with the Parker administration, um, the staff, Parker parents, and then CPAC. I did talk with Sarah from CPAC about kind of my idea of how to roll it out because I think that those most directly affected should have the opportunity to see the report first and then the broader community. Um, and this really is going to continue to guide our work, to give us some feedback on how we are doing, what direction we need to go in, what worked um, at Parker, what didn't work at Parker. Um, and just so that um, the committee knows and the community knows that um, Melissa did a survey of parents. There are 14 students at the Parker, in the Parker Bridge program. We had 12 parents respond. So I feel like we'll have a good sampling of the parent perspective um, in her report. We're going to continue to build connections with CPAC, which um, Sarah is going to talk about in a minute. Uh, I'm going to continue the work I've been doing. I've been visiting classrooms. I go to class. I was just at Parker today. I do classroom visits one to two times a week. Um, just go into classrooms, spend some time in classrooms across the district, um, as well as having office hours. We started a report card working group um, based on some feedback from parents in the CPAC. We've had one meeting. We didn't have all the feedback we needed to have a second meeting, but we are going to have another meeting, um, which includes feedback from parents and teachers um, on the report card as it relates to students with disabilities. Not on the whole report card, but only um, for students with disabilities. So, my really quick request. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciated the thoughtfulness of the review of the bridge program at the middle school level and yeah. who is going to see it first yeah. in what order that makes a lot of sense to me just a request that we get a report yeah. at school committee Absolutely. Yes. at the end of yes. all of it <laughs> thank yes, you, you will. agreed yes thank you will and and i will publicize a copy of it so we'll once it's you know we'll get that out publicly so thanks so again thank you
for for this third the third and final act of your of your presentation. I think I have like you're the oh, is there a fourth and then I'm after. Wait, there's more. Yeah, there's more. There's more. There's more. There's still more. Well, still I'll, I'll give you give you three three impressions there yeah. that I wanted to pass on at this point. I wanted to see, and I'm sure it exists, and, mm -hmm. and I recognize in, in all these presentations there's a tension between your wash of data, you have mm -hmm. your iPad there or your, yep. your, um, your tablet, and, and can access, I'm sure, a, a lot of figures yep. very quickly. Um, I'm just, as, as I heard, what I heard was a lot of description kind of process and inputs, yep. and that's part of, that's how we solve problems, yep. we invest time and resource. But I had three things that, for me, would be helpful in future updates of this mm -hmm. Walker report. Very similar to what I had before. I wrote, demonstrated student benefit of training. I want to see that, right? So, and one way to get at that might be uh, our teacher training. Um, looking at the amount of training we provide to teachers compared, to, uh, where teachers, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. I'm interested in comparing the training of the teachers who are working with the students in the SPED programs you're discussing compared to the what would be available to those students if we place them out of district. So we look in terms of we're bringing students from out of district placements to stay in Reading and we're, we're training teachers and hiring teachers to meet those needs, right? And so what I'm interested in is a comparison of I, 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 have a, I have a difficult time evaluating, say, you, you put 20 hours of training and yeah. invest that in a teacher, and then the teacher goes and teaches a student. What I'm really, that's not the question I want answered. What I, the question I want answered is, if we have our students with that teacher and that training, versus that student's in an alternative placement outside of district, the best available that we could find if we didn't have that teacher and training available, how do those two compare? So what, what, is, what are the capabilities that that student would encounter in an out-of-district placement that are relevant to their mm -hmm. need, right? Not just total capabilities. What are the capabilities of those instructors in out-of-district placements versus the capabilities of the teachers, the expertise, the training that that student receives here in Reading? And if there's a gap, I want to know about that. So if, if you say, well, we get 20 hours of investment um, in toward what would really require 10,000 hours of training for this student's needs to be met mm -hmm. out-of-district, that's a very different situation than out of district someone has 35 hours and in district we have 20 and within two more years they'll be over 35. And, and I don't know if I'm at either of those ends when I see these figures or somewhere in the middle. So that, that would be one, one piece of it. Um, the second thing is lower caseload ratios or faster turnaround times. So as a result of these resources that we're deploying, we're, you, know, you mentioned the assistant director right? 70% of our dollars or more are taxpayer dollars. Taxpayers just gave us more money, mm -hmm. right, in the override. And so you mentioned this assistant director FTE that we're getting mm -hmm. a fraction of FTE, I'm not sure. Help us understand, help the taxpayers see how having this position doesn't lead to you know, internal process. You mentioned procedure manuals, increased number of team chairs. That's, that's the tool. What I want to see is what do you build with the tool? Mm -hmm. And that's what the taxpayer needs to see, is that, look, I, as I remember our discussions about the override, we were going to see lower caseloads. That, that intuitively makes sense. We go from, I don't, I'm making up numbers, 10 to 1 to 8 to 1. That, that's concrete and specific, right, for, for everyone involved. And then faster turnaround times. We're getting to IEP meetings. It used to be take us six months on average. Now we get to them. I'm, I'm just making this yep. number up. But we, we, get, we get to the outcome that is required sooner, better, with a higher quality as a result of these additional resources that taxpayers have provided us. So those are my thoughts. So my question I had on, on the professional, there's two slides mm -hmm. with professional development. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of different things. And uh, I guess is, you know, are we spreading that? You, you mentioned, I think you used the term limited resources. Yes. Are we spreading that out to try and do too much? Uh, are there certain things that we need to, to go back and look at that we're not putting enough resources to? Or, uh, you know, do we need to have more and more in professional development uh, to do all of these mm -hmm. things? Uh, so the challenge this year, if you remember, is that our grant that was primarily professional development came out significantly later and less, and less money. So it hampered sort of a 
broader scope of work. So we didn't receive the grant funds until February. Yeah. So that goes back to my, I mean, if we can't do it, then should we be, I mean, should we be trying? I mean, we can't, if we can't do it right, we shouldn't be trying to do it. So, but I think that's you where you come back to us yeah. and ask for uh, more professional development outside of the mm -hmm. grant. Yeah. Or we go back and look at what we're doing and maybe we can't do it all. Well, we have for the FY19, we do have money in the operating budget, which is really going to help us hit the ground running, which we weren't able to do this year because we everything was grant dependent. So we have you approved funding for next school year. So that is going to be a real positive. I think the things you see on there are things we really need to continue doing. We need to have those one hit um, opportunities because as we just talked about staff turnover, we need to have continuity in our program. So if I have a staff leave in the middle school who was seeing stars trained, I've got to have money to do that. So when you see that, that might be one or two staff going to get that to fill a void that we had. So we have to make sure we have the funding for those pieces. I think the broader component is where is where is the major focus? We've put, you know, we're focusing on our work with the bridge program and you know when we get Melissa Orkin's report, I think that's gonna give us some indication as to whether that was time well invested um, with our work with landmarks school um, that's going to be our true data point there and my hope is it is yes and then we will continue that that relationship um, but you're right it is the, the broader this is where we want to focus our energies that's why I talked about differentiation at secondary level really making a push to do that work um, and the executive functioning piece so really identifying key areas and then strategically how are we going to use those funds for a more broad-based work um, with our staff Yes, I had the same thought as Chuck, just to follow up, but a little bit different. I did, I'll call it spreading the peanut butter too thin. <coughs> right, that, that, you know, I, I see a list of almost two dozen mm -hmm. things in your slides, and, and immediately what goes through my mind, I think it's similar to what Chuck just articulated. You know, how many of these efforts are one-shot wonders, mm -hmm. and how many are really sticky and robust? Mm -hmm. How many are, are actually um, impacting how students are educated and and how do we get at that question and and please let us know where not just the list but put it in context for us of mm -hmm. these these are the the trainings that we do because we have turnover and we need to level mm -hmm. set expectations yeah. these are the trainings to, to develop concentrated expertise in a few teachers mm -hmm. like give us some context yeah. in, in these lists in the future mm -hmm. and, and there have got to be things that we can't do well and let's be honest about what those are, what we could do better if we had more resources or what you would do next if you had yep. more resources. But we, we can't be doing everything as well as we would like. Mm -hmm. So what choices are you making and yep. how you deploy the resources you have? And some of it too is remember we want to give people boosters. So, you know, some of our teachers have been out of a master's program for a long time. And so, like when we talk about writing evaluation reports, it's important to reflect on our practice. And using internal staff who are really strong evaluators is a way we're able to do that at pretty low cost because we may pay them for some of their time to prepare for that. But it's Im so I'm always thinking too about not just sort of, okay, I'm investing in a program. There are a lot of practices we do in special education that require a booster or a revisit for our staff just around our practice and ensuring that, you know, because sometimes we don't take the time to reflect on those small practices, but it does make a big difference. So some of those are low cost, shorter things, but have a big impact on our ability. And then I look at um, thinking of our PECS training that we provided our new preschool teacher. I happened to be at Wood End shortly after she had the training and she couldn't wait to have me come down to her class and say, here's how I'm using this. So there's a direct impact with her students on having that training um, and that's what we're really looking for. If we are going to pay for something that is a one hit, maybe one staff, mm -hmm. I want to see that, we're going to see that implementation. And I think you would agree, Kelly, that yes. that's... It was instant implementation. 
Yeah. Good. So, you know, those are the pieces. I work really closely with the team chairs and principals. When you see something like a LIPS <coughs> training, like that was done for the high school because we knew we had a void there because we had a staff member leave and we needed to get um, someone trained and go to that training. So there are things that are, I would say, is kind of in my booster sort of professional practice review and sharing of practice. And then there are those things that sometimes are just a need mm -hmm. that we need to be able to fill. And then we have those longer term things that we're going to invest in. But we have such a vast we have a, a lot of diversity in our students with disabilities and so that requires all different expertise um, so even though we may pick one thing as a real push for the majority there is also specialized training that needs to happen um, for individual students to meet their needs so. yes I thank you for this presentation I it's a lot to absorb mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is what procedures and tools you have in place to hear back from the teachers about the impact of the, mm -hmm. the professional development. I heard you saying how enthusiastic the teachers were about the opportunities to work vertically mm -hmm. around the programs that they were implemented and about this last mm -hmm. program that you were talking about. When you do the professional development, do you have standard like evaluation forms or feedback mechanisms so that you know what to do again, you know what to follow up on, you know what didn't work? Um, and so, I'd love to yeah. know more about the feedback that sure. you got and then what has been So last to that. year we I did a survey of all of our staff probably around this time last year to have teachers identify what things they were doing around professional development, coaching, or during their PLC time that was really beneficial. What was the most powerful thing that changed their practice. So I did a survey with them and it is something I could repeat for all staff. Um, it really gave some helpful feedback on what teachers and related service staff felt was the most important thing that they did that impacted their practice and then things that they would like to see in the future. And when we have been looking at priorities for professional development, I bring out those survey results from last year because I think it's always important because that's the voice of our teachers saying this is what we think we need, this is what really was helpful. I will say landmark Alan Bloom to the top um, top of the hit and I think I've shared feedback at other um, presentations of feedback teachers have provided me so um, I don't do something after each because some of these are off-site but I did it more as a year-end like tell me about your year what was um, beneficial what impacted your teaching um, what do you think we need to work on so and that sort of helps drive the planning for the next year thank you all right. I'm sorry. Sure. I have a couple questions. Um, and this, I apologize for uh, potential ignorance. The Walker report was completed when? Uh, 2014. 14, 15. 15. And the implementation of Walker's recommendations is just now starting? No. So no. We've been okay. talking about it every year. <clears throat> What has been implemented up to this point? I'd have to go through um, each area. What percentage of Walker reports, recommendations have been implemented in the last four years? I couldn't give you a percentage. There were a lot of recommendations. We've been, yeah, we've been making significant progress throughout the four years on the different we can, recommendations. We can get an up, yep. update on that. Okay. Um, Landmark School is referenced a lot in the list. materials. Mm -hmm. um, and that most of that reference is our outreach to Landmark, uh, our needing their um, guidance. Have we asked Landmark to come in and evaluate our program and credential it or score it or somehow evaluate it? We yes, have? yes, they don't do that. That's why we've gone with Melissa Orkin, um, because they don't provide that service. We did ask them. So it's not a service that Landmark provides. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a lot with the CPAC because we were really desperately searching for someone to evaluate the program, which is why we've asked Dr. Orkin to come in and do that work. And that was done last 
last you went through most of last year trying yes. to find yes. somebody to do that and that's when they found the person from yeah. Tufts doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, could I just ask one question? And Ms. McLaughlin, I'm sorry, no, I you must want to get home. I'm good. I'll ask a quick question. Thank you. So, um, so back to the, um, I also noticed the data you did, Mrs. Borowski, about um, the number of higher mm -hmm. referrals at yeah. one school. And so what are we doing, how, how do you anticipate using so that I, kind of data? So I have a data? whole other section about what yeah. my next steps are after the CPAP. I <laughs> okay. So when I'm you said it was that, coming, it's still coming. It is coming. still coming. Okay. There's Thank still more. Much. There's okay. just Thank one you. more section am, after okay. Melissa. Wonderful. It, Thank yeah. you. We're there. We'll get. All right. Mrs. Williams, did you? I just had a couple of quick questions. I know for a long time we were working on defining co-teaching. Did mm -hmm. that ever get defined? We have not done that. Okay. Um, um, but I, may I ask a question with that, too? I had a similar question. Absolutely. Do you mind? <laughs> um, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so when we say co-teaching, are we use looking at somebody with special education credentials and kind of tra traditional mm -hmm. day? Is that the combination so of the co-teachers? So we co have not defined co-teaching. Okay. That's we do your, have co-teaching yeah. at Birch Matter where we have a general educator and a special educator today together mm -hmm. all day. Yeah. But we have not come, we have not define that, which was okay. something that, you know, we have kind of, kind of been out there. Okay. That was so one of my questions, too. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so how can we be doing it when we haven't defined it? On, <laughs> now we, on. Have, we haven't defined it as a district. We've defined it for the program. The Connections program is a co-taught program with a special ed teacher and a licensed general ed teacher who are in a classroom together all day. So that is what we have at Birch Meadows through the program. Across the district, we haven't gone through as an administrative team. I will say, you know, we I work closely with the principals and gather their feedback of what their priorities are because you don't want to push an initiative that we're not kind of all on board. And that's where I was saying, I think where we're at is working <coughs> at the high school and at the middle school level on differentiation and how how to you best use that additional adult. So if I have a paraprofessional in my classroom, how do I best use that person um, to help support student learning? So, so that's kind of where we've landed related to that. At this point, that could change, but. So we're done interrupting you. <laughs> yeah. No, okay, so feel free. Um, and then I think I asked Sarah, but I'll just ask publicly, um, exiting, ed Exit and entry criteria. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing that yep. the special ed community would love to yep. see. Is that so? That's where we kind of define landed on that program description, which okay. will have the profile of the students. Um, I think we kind of discussed that the problem with entrance and exit criteria is that a, a decision has to be made by a team. And one of the things I ran into when I first came on board is that when we had sort of a or that people in different programs had a perception of the profile of the students. Sometimes a teacher or one person would say, yes, that student is coming to the program or no. And that decision really has to be made by a team. So I think having those um, profiles that really outline these are the profile of the students who are in this program will then guide the team in making that decision. Um, I'm not sure if I'm not understanding or if I have a different uh, thought process on entry and exit but as a parent I would think you would want just like I want to know what is it that I my child needs to be entered into this program mm -hmm. what boxes do they mm -hmm. check what does this program offer my child mm -hmm. are we saying two different things or no nope, I think we're saying okay. the same I think okay. that's the goal of this okay um, we deal with individual children right and my struggle is always it's not necessarily a box you know that we service all students here right. in Reading and so one of the recommendations from Walker is that we work our programs we were putting students and fitting students into the programs versus designing programs for individual students okay. and so I want to be cautious that we are making decisions as an IEP team that are based on that individual student not based on a checklist saying yep you meet that or no you don't meet that um, we sometimes you know, we do our best to service students, mm -hmm. and we adapt our programs for individual students because that's what we do. We're a public school, right. um, and so 
I know that people want that clear language. I've actually reached out to other directors in the area and through the SEAM Collaborative to see if other people use entrance and exit and if they could share that. My concern is, and we've talked about this openly, that I don't want people to interpret that that means the student goes to a program right. because it's still the decision of the team. Right. And so just because my child or, the, or that student I work with checks all those boxes, they may be doing really well in their home school and doesn't need to go to a program. Right. And so I, that's where I worry about entrance and exit. I think we need to have guiding um, criteria or guiding principles that a team is looking at. This is the population of students that this program is designed for. Right. This is the profile cognitively, behaviorally, right. social, emotionally. But that the IEP team needs to make that decision with the parents present. Okay. I think as a parent, I, I am looking at different programs and I'm thinking, what does it offer that yep. this one doesn't yep. offer? So that's how yep. I And that's what I'm hoping by having the methodologies, yep. Yep. you know, okay. the, the, the type of program, is it a full inclusion, partial, substantially separate? Okay. What are the methodologies? What tools do they use for progress monitoring? Mm -hmm. I think that I'm hoping that will give a broader sense of this is what the program is but I think then once we have that it gives us a place to say where do where are the gaps now okay right now we have a lot of gaps I think we all agree in that information so once we have that document maybe it will help us say is that enough do you need more okay you know or some programs might be further along as I said you know okay some people have a lot yeah, no, Some absolutely, are. absolutely. So. Um, and I have just a couple more questions. Is there an update on the BCBA? Um, we have not started interviewing yet. We do oh, have candidates, okay. but yes. Okay. We do have candidates. Once is there an ETA on? Um, I want to wrap up the assistant director first. Okay. <laughs> Once that's taken care of, then there's a couple other positions, so those will be done quickly after. So okay. probably early next week, I hope to get those. Okay. Uh, we do have a lot of candidates. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of professional development with staff, is there, and I, I'm guessing this is probably collective bargaining kind of thing that you can't talk about, but is there a way to put in people's contracts what, like if you give them a certain professional development and something that's like high end, like say, um, I'll use OG or Wilson, is there a way to hang on to those staff members in contracts? It's one contract for all the people. Yeah. They don't. They, okay. The only ones that have individual contracts would be uh, central office or uh, okay. principals. I figured. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, one other question I had, um, which I can talk to you offline about, is um, Compass. I, I never realized that Compass was Wood End and Birch, mm -hmm. but they're two significantly yeah. different programs. Are they? Is there? Are they going to rename what the Wood End? Uh, no, because when they go to Coolidge, they come together. Interesting. Okay. Yes. And then my last question is, I don't. I think it would be helpful to see a graph on the disability to the student cost ratio. Mm -hmm. So. Um, do you know what I'm asking? So if you have Explain autism more. and it's costing, I'd like to see a graph that shows what disabilities are costing us in the district. Is that just, just in district or in versus out? Just for you. Yeah, I was just, I'm curious if, you know, one disability is costing the district more and are we, is it because we're outsourcing it? Is it because, do you know what I'm asking? So what you mean, a a specific program or yeah. and if those kids are in a program just food for thought can what about the number in versus out of district by category so autism yes. to use your example is does that address your question or is are you asking for specific for the dollars um, I think I'm, I'm looking for what the disability so like say we'll use autism what that would cost the what is that costing the district overall mm -hmm. to have and it can include in my opinion both in and out yeah. 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 yes Thanks. um i like where you like I, I think i get where you're going with that one potential concern with that particular methodology is i think we have a number of students who have multiple disabilities yeah. so if you have a child who has you know is on the spectrum and has a social emotional d disability and maybe um, a, a writing disability mm -hmm. how would you budget that 
Okay. How would you? So, so maybe I think there are very few children who fit one I think exact. It's more yeah. Kids are more complicated. Programs and yes, what we're that spending might be, on them, and yes, are we spending yeah. enough? Or, or yeah. are we spending astronomically one place and not enough in another? Yeah. Is it even across the district? Yeah. Yeah. Be interesting. That might see. be. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Right. You're out, Sarah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Do you want the clicker or do you want me to? You can be the van on. Oh, okay. That works I will be van. Um, <laughs> so I have people to actually see the slide. So I'll be quick. Um, I think I've met most of you, but I'm Sarah McLaughlin. I have two daughters uh, who go to school in the district. And I'm also one of the co-chairs of the CPAC. Do you want to flip forward, Carolyn? So I think everybody kind of knows what the CPAC is, the special education. <laughs> Parents Advisory Council. Thank you. Uh, so we were, we're a resource to the district in many ways. So to represent um, and support kids with special needs. So uh, we do that in a lot of different ways by providing support to parents as a group to come and talk to. Um, we act as advisors to the school committee, to director of student services, to the superintendent. Uh, we help attempt to promote communication between all, all the vested parties in the district and parents, particularly. Um, and then we also host a lot of workshops and um, presentations on different topics. So uh, to that note, so we did, we had a lot of success this year <coughs> with different topics. Um, the first uh, workshop is one that we're required to do by the state, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it is really important, um, special ed, there's a, a really steep learning curve for parents. There's a lot of three-letter acronyms. It's a lot of information you have to learn quickly. Um, and you don't need to know it until you need to know it. So um, that first one, that uh, basic rights that was hosted, it really kind of gives an overview of special education law and procedures. And then the next one also is really helpful. I, I actually went to this one this year as well. I've attended it in the past. The IEP for my child gets more specific. It explains the individual uh, education program, how it's developed, how you write goals for your child and their needs, and then more, most importantly, how you monitor that moving forward. Um, some of the other exciting things we did, we had Sarah Ward come, who was a great, really well-attended workshop. And to Carolyn, I think it was your point earlier, that um, that was a, particularly a workshop that was attended by parents in gen ed and special ed. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of high school and middle school mm -hmm. students actually yeah. came with yeah. their parents. The yeah. smart parents dragged their kids with them <laughs> and yeah. had notebooks and pens and, and had them also kind of getting tips uh, through the workshop. Um, and then we had Lisa Studer, who's our district BCBA, come and kind of talk a little bit more about her role in the district, what she does, and then um, it was right before school, April vacation week. Mm -hmm. So how do you survive those transition periods for kids who are used to the structure of the school week and day? Um, and then how do you have a productive and enjoyable time out of that structure? Um, we were lucky enough to have Karen and Tara come present. I did a longer, we were lucky to have a longer version of what they presented uh, to you tonight. And then most recently we had Nancy Duggan from, the, um, she was the director of Decoding Dyslexia to present and that was also a very well attended workshop. Um, she talked a lot about uh, the neuroscience behind reading, um, about uh, what should be taken into consideration in assessments and uh, how to recognize instruction that will work for your child. So it's kind of the highlights of our presentations. I won't read off those, you guys can kind of read it for yourselves, but um, some of the exciting things we did this year I don't think we've done before. Uh, we did sponsor a tree at the REF uh, Festival of Trees. That was really cool. Uh, the theme was uh, puzzles and puzzle pieces that you know, we're all a piece of the puzzle. So no matter what our label is that's put on us, um, we're all part of the Reading community. And uh, we had parents donate different fidgets and puzzles and things to decorate the tree. It was really cool. Um, and we already started planning for next year with Carolyn, you know, based on parents' um, interests and needs that we've been hearing this year, thinking ahead, what do we want to focus on, what kinds of presentations, what are the, the kind of the meat of the work we want to do next year as well. Um, I think we've also heard a need for um, assistive technology, again, another kind of cross-gen ed and special ed topic that parents are really interested in. We're hoping to have somebody come in and present on that next year. We already touched on a lot of these, the ongoing parent concerns, um, based on kind of the conversations we have, the emails we get. Um, again, closing that achievement gap. Um, you know, the length of time it's taking us to, to kind of close that gap in certain areas, particularly. Um, the learning disabilities, the kids with learning disabilities, it's the biggest chunk of our population of kids with IEPs. So um, making sure we're focusing on doing an evaluation of bridge, but in addition to bridge, the specialized reading, which I believe the most kids 
um, who get reading services through the, the district or through specialized reading, not through the bridge program necessarily. Um, and then we've already really hit on this, I think. Um, parents need information. They don't need to know it till they need to know it. So it might have been posted, it might have been emailed three months ago, but I wasn't paying attention three months ago because I didn't need to know about that. So I've talked to Carolyn a lot about making sure we have information and we're going to work on updating the websites. Yeah, I think yeah, we're going to touch on that. We're going to work on updating um, our website. But uh, making sure we have the program descriptions, including the entrance and exit criteria, helping parents to make informed decisions for their kid, especially as they're starting to explore different um, resources or programs. Um, the documentation of staff training and certifications we've touched on quite a bit. Again, really important to understand, especially as my kids' needs evolve, perhaps, um, you know, this, these are some of our, our most vulnerable learners. So are the staff that we have at my school capable of, you know, helping with X problem? Or am I going to have to start, you know, we'll have to think about moving to a different in-district in school or whatever that is. Um, so I think that's really important to make sure parents feel supported and informed. I think that's it. Any questions about CPAC? Can we can move on to Carolyn's last uh, yes. overture. Yes. It's just a comment. I wanted to thank you, and I'm sure the whole community has too, for your service. I think this is hard work. It's obviously mm -hmm. volunteer work. Um, so thank you for, for the time that you've clearly put in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. All right. And the last pieces are where do we go from here? So there was a lot of questions about the referral data. Um, so we need the, the continued collaboration with the CPAC to consider ways for us to have direct communication with parents. Sarah and I have talked a lot about what is the way that we can get information to parents and get have that two-way conversation as well, but feeling like you know, is it creating a newsletter that's going out quarterly from the student services office to parents or a blog that has more regular communication about what's happening in the district or related to training at a particular school. So that's really the feedback of really con continuing to figure out with the CPAC how do we how do we get the information to parents? We've talked about even you know do I send something to the principals to put out in their blast so that because parents typically read mm -hmm. what the principal sends. Um, so one thing I would like you know and I'm going to talk with the CPAC when we meet. I'd like to consider writing a year-end newsletter including a lot of the information in here and blasting that out to parents at the end of the school year with some identified goals for next school year. Um, we have to continue to look at our in-district program and ensure vertical alignment to make sure what we're doing and our methodologies from elementary, middle to high school are, um, are kind of more aligned. We need more focus next year on our middle school and high school TSP programs. We haven't talked a lot about that, but last year, we, this current year we've, and the year before, we worked a lot on our TSP program at Kellum. And so we need to put some energy into middle school and high school, again, for that vertical alignment. There's a lot of students that meet with success in that in-district program, and we want to be able to continue that. Um, we need to have, I need to collaborate with the new assistant superintendent on goals around literacy for all students. So the concerns around specialized reading, they start with us providing a um, high quality tier one instruction in reading for all students. And we need to ensure that that program is happening for all students with a focus on our K-1-2 um, students and then also looking at what we're providing. But we need our teachers also, our special educators, to ensure they have a good foundation on understanding the evaluation results from our special ed evaluations and then what would be the matching of the appropriate methodology. That's a lot of the concern that I'm hearing from parents is ensuring that do our teachers have that understanding and I think we have ranges of that ability but that's an important piece of continuing to build the capacity. That's the work we started with Dr. Orkin at Joshua Eaton. Um, we do have some staff who have gone and received their dyslexia certification and other things but we need to make sure that's a broad stroke um, um, to really ensure those evidence-based um, programs are in place. Um, so we need to make a decision based on our information that we see, receive from Dr. Orkin. Our next step is to do an evaluation of either the bridge program at Eaton, which my recommendation would be to wait till January of 2019 to have it by the end of the year so we can do a little more work with them, or um, do uh, the bridge program at RMHS. And I would recommend that um, earlier. The, um, 
the concern is just that there's only so much money and so um, I think you know if we wanted to do this more comprehensive piece I'm concerned about the financial impact of that um, but I can price that out with Dr. Orkin and, and present that to the school committee so that we can have a discussion on that we should determine a timeline for evaluation of the specialized reading services so that we can um, communicate that out to you guys by the fall so I will work with Dr. Orkin I'd like to see her report before I commit to using her we haven't gotten her report yet so far so good but you want to see the product um, so that's where I'm saying in the fall being able to communicate with you a timeline and giving you a sense of the cost for doing these program evaluations because it does cost a lot of money to do that and so I just want to make sure that we're we're kind of being um, you know appropriate with the use of our money so um, I think we're that's an, I mean we've been talking about Joshua Eaton for yep. too long now yep. uh, I think it's important that we get that cost for okay so we'll look at that we need to work next year on the development of the role of the assistant director of student services so as mr. Bobbin pointed out that we can talk about what the outcomes and the benefit to the community are of having this position um, not just the tasks that they'll be doing so that's going to be a big push as of things that I want to work on we need to strengthen the role of team chairs we're going to support them next year in increasing the amount of supervision and evaluation they're going to be providing for teachers as you remember from our conversations around budget and override um, the reason we chose to put a full-time team chair at Killam and Joshua Eaton is that those are our two largest elementary schools and um, next year we'd like to see at least those two team chairs and our team chairs at the high school doing more supervision and evaluation of special educators which will help our principals um, with the work they need to do in those buildings so um, I'd really like to work with the assistant superintendent on recommendations for report cards so based on the working group the feedback that I've received work closely with the assistant superintendent on revisions to that as I said revise the decap and roll that out in fall of 2018 and um, as we talked about reviewing the student services website in consultation with the CPAC and special education staff to make sure that the student services website has the information that parents need staff need community need um, as a resource um, and then what I didn't write on there Sherry <laughs> God, was about the parent piece one thing I would really like to do this fall with um, parent referrals and I've talked with a number of my principals about this is I, I don't want to delay we're not going to delay the evaluation process because parents have a right to an evaluation but when we receive a parent request for a referral I'd like the principal and the team chair to meet with the parent or at least have a, a phone conversation to really develop a better understanding of why they're looking to have their child evaluated for special education I think it's important that we're investing that time with parents and really gaining that understanding and helping educate them about the process as Sarah mentioned like you don't need to know it until you're in it and I think sometimes parents don't understand exactly what they're requesting and the amount of time and the impact for their child so how much time is your child really going to be pulled out of the classroom for this process and what are really the areas that you suspect your child has a disability because sometimes some of the conversation I've had is that parents said oh my pediatrician said to do this or that they think they want their child to get some extra help and this isn't the mechanism for extra help it's the mechanism for supporting students with disabilities and so we need to that's where having the DCAP our curriculum accommodation plan to say this is how we support all learners and these are things that we can put in place for your child they don't require an IEP these are services and interventions that we can have happen so we will I think it will help us to develop relationships with parents and understand more of what their concerns are if we take the time to do those meetings when we get a referral and it could be a phone meeting it doesn't have to be a face-to-face -face. I think my preference is always face-to-face because -face you learn a lot and you build your relationship but I think having that direct connection and not just processing paperwork would help us um, in kind of building bridges um, and helping in communication yeah and may I just answer you know, um, so it would be interesting to of course collect that data you get from those discussions too to yeah. see what the trends are for because maybe there's a, a curriculum yeah. area that needs yes. additional training yes. or support or something yes. that's 
coming out, the symptom might be yeah, right. asking Some for more uh, curriculum right, yeah, based right, versus yeah. student individual yes. student base. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. And we need to do that work and really figure out, you know, where is the real need because right. even though we see those spikes. I think when I show you the, the end data come the fall, you're not going to see, there's still not going to be one for one finding yeah. of eligibility, right? So what's that discrepancy? I also will have in the fall the data on referrals that were school-based and the number of school-based referrals because our teachers refer students for evaluation as well. And how many of those students were found eligible. So. These are some pictures from my classroom observations. Uh, it's been really a blast to be in the classrooms and seeing the work that's happening and um, just seeing the, the representation of our students. Um, and the teachers are always so welcoming and happy to have me come in and, and to showcase what they're doing. So that is it. Gail was waiting for the mm -hmm. smiley face at the end. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Just the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not true. Has the number of parental requests for evaluations gone up in grades where we've collapsed tracks? Mm, no, because it's mostly elementary. Okay. We've definitely seen an increase at Parker. I, you know, but that would be interesting to look at at Parker. Coolidge in the high school. I'd be very but our, to know. definitely our big increase has been more elementary, but, mm. but it's a good hypothesis. Go ahead. Um, so one thing that strikes me in the what we heard tonight is is we had Ms. McLaughlin give us ongoing parent concerns, and there were four of them. And then we had, where do we go from here? It was direct communication with parents. Mm -hmm. I can't help but connect the two over the last question mark mm -hmm. slide and, and say, it seems like there are four things parents want to know about if, mm -hmm. if, yeah. if, I, if I heard right, right? Program. What's the achievement gap and what are yeah. we doing about it? What's the evidence of it being closed? Um, second, uh, what is being done for students that require specialized reading mm -hmm. programming? Yeah. Right. Third, what are the entrance and exit criteria? We've heard that yeah. many times from many different people. And many different updates. Yep. And fourth, what staff training and certifications? Yep. What are the what are the outcomes for students that we're seeing for those those investments in our in our teachers? So, it would seem that you have over a thousand touch points with parents mm -hmm. right now because, if I did the math right, there's around 1,100 requests for IEPs. Those are your parents. Yep. Those are the people who care about those four things. Mm -hmm. So. Don't miss the opportunity. You can you can do a one pager, maybe both yeah. sides with that information. There you go. Please respond. Second point: the taxpayers kindly gave us an assistant director of student services. Right? Let's give that person some great smart goals. Mm -hmm. Here are some ideas. Yeah. Reduce the caseload among special ed team leaders to below a number. Mm -hmm. Right, whatever that number is. Uh, it used to be this. Now because of the work that this new team member is doing, it's now a lower number, right? Second, um, ensure some kind of, I'll call it a gap analysis for, te for, for parents. That if their child is an IEP and they require, like I talked about before, if they require an expertise and it's not available in the next grade, we're gonna let your child know by this touch point, which we already have scheduled. So use, use the channels we already have in place to, instead of adding new, you know, may, maybe you want to add a newsletter or something like that, but before I go there, I would want to get everything out of the current meeting schedules and everything in my Outlook calendar that is very full, I'm sure, right? You already have the meetings. Um, and then another idea, um, ensure that each uh, student-teacher ratio of some number, when you match up teachers with certifications and the students who benefit from those certifications, right? So in the subpopulation of students who need this expertise in their teachers, we have a 13 to 1 or a 10 to 1 or a 15 to 1 ratio. We're going to reallocate the FTEs because of the insights from this assistant director of student services to achieve something that is viewed as a better outcome for students in aggregate. So nice smart goals. And share those with us. I mean, I think that would be great for us to know. Jean? Just a quick thought as you're processing. I like, I, I do like the idea that you're thinking about reaching out a little more proactively through a newsletter or blog or something. But you mentioned a couple different vehicles. I would consider the cultural impact of those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I had immediate positive reaction to the idea of it being part of a wider building-wide 
newsletter or blog because it communicates that mm -hmm. this is a population within yep. the school that's important and everyone needs to know about it mm -hmm. not just parents with children mm -hmm. with disabilities we're talking about understanding disabilities tonight and that it could just be one more. it's another opportunity to add that sense of inclusion as opposed to this is coming from this department for this population mm -hmm. of students and yep. nobody else really needs to see yep. it so yep that's great really bad thank you sure yes I actually have a question I'm I guess I'm sort of surprised that IEP planning does not include this insight into where someone is going, wh where the children are going and what services will await them. It does include that, but we plan based on the individual student. We don't, we are, we cannot plan based on our budget, based on okay. who is trained or not trained. So we can't say, oh, no, you can't get that service at the high school because we don't offer that. We tr so IEPs are written based on the individual students and the recommendation of those teachers that work with them. If we anticipate any gaps, That's we right. do that very early. That's what comes up in our budget. So if there's a budgetary implication, if I know a student's going to the high school who needs a one-to-one -one or they need specialized equipment or something else, we're doing that planning in November. More, I think, of what Mr. Boavin is thinking about is just those, those teaching methodologies um, and when we, we know there might be a vacancy, maybe someone's retiring, that it wasn't really part of the, this kind of process. But we do plan for that, but we do not write IEPs for the school. We write IEPs for a student. And so whatever they need, we're required to implement. And so if we were to identify that there was a not an appropriately credentialed person, we would need to either contract, which we have done, and we've done that for school psychologists, or we would owe compensatory services, which we have done both this year. Um, and offered compensatory services in some instances when we've had a gap in services, or <coughs> we've contracted with someone who is an appropriate person for an interim period of time. So, but I think the piece I'm hearing is more, if we know it's gonna happen, that we communicate with parents, we tell them the plan, ahead of time. Not that we change the IEP, right. but more we're being transparent about right now the only person that we had trained in the LIPS methodology that your child is receiving we know is retiring. We Our goal is to get so and so trained, but we want to be transparent if that's what I'm... Yes. Okay. And I think that the chart that uh, or the, mm -hmm. the uh, compilation of resumes is, is mm -hmm. what, yep. what is part of that. It doesn't have to go that far in my mind, but make the decision that's right for the mm -hmm. for our district. But I, at a minimum, I'd want to see what I call the gap analysis. Yep. Hey, there's a gap. We haven't filled it yet. This is what we're trying to do. But mm -hmm. next year, right now, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I just, I just, one of my reactions, I just struggle because it sounds like that gap moves that um, we might have a gap and then and I'm not saying I'm not judging this mm -hmm. it just sounds very difficult to keep up with that because the IEPs are constantly doing what hopefully what they should do and identifying the needs of kids so what <coughs> what it finds might be different for each mm -hmm. kid at any moment yeah. which will identify that gap which then entails budget and staffing mm -hmm. changes as well as space and location. So it just it I just wanted to acknowledge how mm -hmm. how complex this it is. It can be very complex <laughs> depending on the type of students or you know what's happening in the, in the district at that time, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to have all the presenters and yeah. the public participate. Oh, we get to the post. The post. Yeah. So you received the memo. Oh, yes. um, so I'm not going to read through that. We would like to continue our um, collaboration with the Wakefield Public Schools 
um, with our, our post program. You saw the, um, the projections of the number of students we have had enrolled, our projections for students coming into that program. We've had um, great success um, programmatically for those students, both with the opportunities. I think I provided you some specific examples of internships that students are participating in, social activities. It's really given our students an opportunity to be out in the community. We've also started with our high school students who are we're anticipating um, who will be going to the post program. They're going over to have some social gatherings um, with the post program and seeing the space. Um, so our recommendation is to continue the agreement. We did work with Wakefield to make some, some I think, pretty significant uh, changes to the agreement that have a, a, a strong um, positive financial impact for us and I think they were very amenable. Um, I think there's agreement by both of us that we think that it's the right thing for students programmatically, socially, the, the benefit to our students and then um, I think we were able to work through some of the financial components. So I don't know if you want to highlight that. I think some of the um, more significant changes were in the original agreement there was a calculation for sort of the recouping of some of the capital costs. The, it was originally in the renewal we worked very closely with Wakefield and actually had that removed so that will that is a savings for us. The other part that will be helpful in the original agreement it was a 50-50 mm -hmm. split of the cost. Now it's going to be very much based upon student enrollment mm -hmm. and the other part that will be helpful that we were able to mm -hmm. negotiate with them is it's a quarterly enrollment so it's not if the student was enrolled July 1st and they yeah. aged out or something changed and they were no longer in the program in October we would not they would not be included in account in the ongoing the quarter age. so yeah. every quarter we will recast the amounts we're also making sure we're implementing quarterly reviews mm -hmm. either phone calls or in person it's easy enough Wakefield's not that far that we'll sit down and review staffing review program costs um, we did also to sort of protect both sides is we do sort of have a floor concept so that if we actually do not have any students there'll be a minimal amount that basically keeps us in the program but it wouldn't be whereas currently now it would be we would still be 50% of the cost so we felt we tried to look at all of the various aspects and try to contain the cost so this was a bugaboo of mine when we first mm -hmm. went into this yeah. thing uh, what changed did they have other towns in there now or no we are still trying to actively yeah, get we are other trying to find other communities yeah. but I think um, I think we had a common understanding at the school level and um, it seems like at this point there hasn't been interference. No, this has actually already been yeah, agreed so we're upon good. by the town yeah. manager of Wakefield. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yes. I, I think you and I both at the time had a concern about this. Yep. I was thrilled to see this change because mm -hmm. it, it it really does reflect that we've entered into this new agreement and it was the right decision at the time yeah. for a variety yeah. of reasons, but I was so happy to see that there's ongoing review and mm -hmm. how can we be more efficient yep. and fair, frankly. Yep. This is, uh, that I thought it was mm -hmm. a wonderful it, it um, does change. Also capture the concept if there are other students that get tuition into the program we everyone benefits, benefits from yeah. that that gets split based upon the ratio of students attending as well so we tried to look at it from every avenue to make sure that we had the most protection we mm -hmm. could from a cost structure yeah. Yeah. Excellent. yes so cost there's the, the, the main changes are in section four right that's marked here yes. in my mind yes um, it's all about the money um, so we've talked about this is a very detailed pro rata split but what I don't see in the memo or here is I mean you have estimates from other service mm -hmm. providers yep. here but do you have estimates for what this will cost Reading for these students? So we have looked um, I did do an analysis to look on average how much it has cost us per student historically <coughs> and it's ranged from this year's probably because we've had fewer students yeah. but in 2016, it was on average about $35,000 per student, and that was us absorbing 50% of the cost. 
Last year was approximately 50,000 per student. This year we've had fewer students, so the cost actually is closer to approximately, and I don't have a full year yet, about 80,000 per student. But that's where but this that new... Where we would be significantly less going forward because our proportion of students is significantly so we're, less. We got, at first year we had 150K cap, and now there's no cap, right? Correct, because right. we'll be doing the split based on the student. Right, and so as of cost. right now, looking at the projected mm -hmm. numbers, we are still, we will have fewer students yeah. then, so we will be paying less than 50%. Mm -hmm. And we pay always at least 10%, even yeah. if Correct. it's zero. And that was in order to keep the program. Yeah, to keep it moving. Almost. And the cost now, I think we have some cost stability in yes. the program, um, so we can better project um, those expenses now that they're staffed um, we have a pretty consistent group of students so and we've also been able to remove the capital cost of it which did add um, about ten thousand dollars a year for each of the years we were in the program so we will not have that cost that will be a savings as well as well as we did some clarification if there are any shared services how that will will work as well Motion. Um, can I ask a question first? Read the motion and <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> okay. Move to approve the proposed three year intermunicipal agreement between the town of Wakefield and the town of Reading for the post program. Second. 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 Now you further okay. discussion. <laughs> So my question was in the contract it specifies that the superintendent will be making the decisions or the designee and I was just wondering because I know that the pupil services person is the most closely related to the program so is it sort of an assumption that the superintendent will work with or delegate to the yes. pupil services? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the director of finance is really involved. Sorry. Well. So and typically, yeah, it's a financial I will say from the beginning, yeah. the collaboration has been with Wakefield's director of special ed and director of finance and myself and the director of finance, like the four of us doing that work because we need the budget people and we're the program people. And so we, <laughs> we come together and that sort of helps us in the planning and the process. So. I didn't so, mean to leave you out. Oh, no, that's... Well, I don't <laughs> want to leave Ms. Dowd out of the work. The bunch of people? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we have to, do we have to bus the kids here, too? It looks yes, like it's only we do transport. So we, do tra we do have transportation. Um, we are currently working with Wakefield as well on that because they do have some Their 7D own. buses that they run on their own, so we're looking at bus routes with them and... Um, Mrs. Wilson and I actually reviewed earlier in the year where they gave us some proposed pricing based upon the number of students they had and the transportation we had through seeing was cheaper. Right. So we actually do that analysis as well to determine what is the <coughs> cost effective, safest way to get the children to the program. But we'll revisit again with the yeah. start of the new year. Any other discussions, any discussions from the community? All those in favor? Five, zero. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. So just to let the committee know, we are slated to present this. This also does need to be approved by the select board. So we will be presenting to them next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Evening. Next Tuesday, yeah. Next Tuesday. And then Wakefield needs to do the same. And their timing is there within a week of ours. I think their school committee next week and then their select council. I think they're in June. In June. Select council. I don't, they changed their name. Okay. Town, council. Town council, thank you. Council. Then we have the uh, collaborative appointments. Yeah, this is an annual appointment to the collaboratives under the regulations. Um, the school committee needs to approve um, either the superintendent of the board or a member of the school committee. So this would be for the North Shore Education Consortium and the SEAM Collaborative. 
I move to appoint Superintendent John F. Doherty as the Reading Public Schools representative to the Board of Directors of the North Shore Education Consortium for the 2018-2019 school year. Second. Dr. Doherty, is there uh, any school committee members on that now? Uh, not in, in either board. Move to appoint Superintendent John F. Doherty as the Reading Public Schools representative to the Board of Directors of the SEAM Collaborative for the 2018-2019 school year. Second. Second. Any discussion? Ready for the phone call in favor? Five zero. That's it. Reports. I have one. Um, this is a little bit of an unusual report, but I do think it's an important one. I think we all know that one of the best parts of being a school committee member is getting to be in the classroom, getting to be in the schools. And so last week I had the opportunity to spend a morning at Joshua Eaton. And I just wanted to um, recognize Ms. Ippolito particularly, but all of the staff there. I haven't been in Eaton during the school day in about two years. And I was so impressed with the culture in the building, the behavior of the students, um, their enthusiasm, their engagement. But the, they were also very relaxed and happy. There wasn't a high level of anxiety. I was very, very impressed. I went to four different classes. Classrooms. Um, I also went to both of the bridge classrooms and spent some time with those students too. We had snack together. Um, it was it was really very impressive, and I had that moment of thinking. So much of the work we do is here, and it's presentations, and it's data, and it would be something if the community could get in. They can't practically. Mm -hmm. They're students. We have to protect them. We can't have hordes of people going through all the time. But it, it really is the work that she's doing in that building, the staff is doing, is very impressive. Um, I specifically wanted to recognize the Reader's Workshop, which I had never seen that curriculum in practice. Um, and I'm absolutely persuaded it's the best early literacy program we could be using. So I'm very happy that we're using that district-wide. Um, and at least the two teachers I saw are implementing it with fidelity very, very well. So um, thank you to her and the staff and to the students who were an absolute delight. Thank you. Do you have one too about some? Yeah. Uh, okay. It's probably it's similar. There are three of us who are at the same event, and so I'll either Mr. Boyden or Dr. Doxer can speak to that. I wanted to thank Understanding Disabilities and also the Women's League for sponsoring Mandy Harvey coming. We spoke of it earlier, I won't belabor it, but um, it was just such a profound experience. And our students' questions, as you mentioned, Ms. Sarovich and, and Ms. Price, were fantastic. And I really want to also thank the Parker Music Department because they helped set up um, and prepare for that event. So thank you so much for bringing that to our community. Thanks. Talk about the World Cafe, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do you want to talk about the World Cafe? Yeah, go ahead. Somebody. <laughs> well, I actually, at before the World Cafe, I wanted to say um, that I was able to go to two in school programs. One was to the Slam Poetry event with the fifth graders at Barrows, and what they did was they picked, uh, they actually ripped pages out of books, old books that were no longer in use, and they found a target word that meant something to them, and then they found other words that related, and they created poetry around those, and the enthusiasm of the students about their poetry, both their own poetry and their peers' poetry, so was really moving. Um, and the topics ranged from silly to serious to intense to light and, and environment, I don't, just, they were all very, very different and they did artwork with it. Um, and the room was full with parents and um, special thanks go out to the li library media specialist there who I didn't bring her name with me. Um, Mrs. Pappas. Mrs. Pappas, thank you very much. Um, but she initiated this project and followed through and coordinated all the different classrooms, fifth grade classrooms. And Ms. Hill, too, sorry. Ms. Hill as well, they work together. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Hill, too. Um, I only met Ms. Pappas, but yes, uh, both. It's a, 
it's really a collaboration in these schools and taking the energy of the kids and putting it towards these positive projects is really um, moving, as you said, Ms. Brodsky. Um, also, I went to the setup of the Unity project that is um, set up outside the front door. I won't say a lot about it, but being a part of the setup was really just seeing the teachers and the students interact is something I really advise for everybody to see because there's such a natural connection and energy that goes around these projects. Um, okay, and so the World Cafe project, it felt like so long ago already. Mm. Um, it's actually, um, I think, more appropriate to call it Community Conversations. The name of the that was given to that was the Pulse of Reading. And the objective was to bring people together to talk about, people with all different voices, to talk about the things they value in Reading, the obstacles they encounter in Reading, and the um, the ways they see to move forward and to talk at a table of four or five people <coughs> honestly from the heart about these things and then to move next to where do we go from here. Um, people came in <coughs> with all different expectations I believe and, and you guys can speak to that from the tables that you were at. Um, but at the end, when asked whether they thought it would be a good idea, this was a pilot, and the idea was to hone in on questions and process. Um, and in the end, when asked whether people thought this was something that we should move forward to and offer to a larger um, segment of the community, it was, I think, unanimous, if not unanimous, overwhelmingly positive that it should happen. And very creative ideas came out, one of which was coupling this with the celebration of the 375th anniversary celebrations that are ongoing, adding fun, making it a way for people to meet, with e to meet each other, connect, and get beyond some of the obstacles that are in our way. Um, so many thanks go to the library for sponsoring and hosting this. Um, and everybody, it was about 60-something people that were there, and the goal of the people there was espoused to be 600 at the next one. We'll be talking to you about the field house. Um, but the goal is to get as many people as we can together to talk beyond our divisions to what binds us as residents of Reading. I think you covered it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Back to Doherty. I have um, I'm good. I have updated you. I have updated you. Um, I have two. Um, tomorrow evening, I'm sorry, Wednesday evening. Thank you. Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock, uh, up in the library, mm -hmm. high school library is our uh, town, school, police, uh, fire, safety summit. So our plan is to have a presentation of how we address safety and security in our town and school buildings. Um, myself, the town manager, police chief, um, and well, so they're going to be doing the presentation. Um, and the fire chief will be available, director of facilities, Director of Finance, um, other other administrators will be there um, to answer any questions. Um, it, obviously, the timing wasn't aligned to the recent um, school shooting that just happened in Texas, but um, it does keep give people the opportunity to ask questions um, on the types of things that we are doing. And uh, we did. Um, it's very similar to the presentation that that we were going to offer with Parent University, so it is similar. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of good information. <coughs> so that's, that's on Wednesday evening. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that last Friday, uh, just after school ended, a little bit after school ended, about 3 o'clock, we had a, a shelter in place um, slash lockdown. It started as a lockdown, then transferred to a shelter in place uh, in this area, the, the Birch Meadow Complex, which included Birch Meadow Coolidge and the high school. Um, I want to commend um the staff that were involved in those three buildings and there were many 
because uh, we had extended day programs going on. We actually had athletic events that were about to begin. Uh, so we had to make sure the fields were cleared. We had buses coming in from other communities for, for, of teams. Um, so it really was a team effort um, to make sure that everyone was as safe as possible. So I do want to commend all of the staff that were involved uh, in that we did have a debriefing today and talked about the things that worked with the, with the police to talk about the things that worked, the things that we could do better, and some, some next steps in the, in the process. So, um, but it did have a positive outcome, which obviously is what we're always looking for. Well, I, where is, I know, I've heard of it obviously from you, but the safety summit, were we advertising that so people, people We ask. sent out a broadcast uh, last week mm -hmm. via connected to our okay. uh, school community. I believe it, I don't want to misspeak, but I believe it was also announced at the so school board meeting. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why we're having it at six is because there are two open houses uh, at the middle schools Wednesday evening right after that. So. Motion. Future Move to adjourn. Oh. oh. I'm going to hold you to that. Is there any future business <laughs> that people would like to put on the agenda? <laughs> yes. I have five things that I'd like to put on the table that we can discuss, I hope, in the future. So, no particular order, but five things that tonight's conversations have prompted me to write down as future <coughs> school committee meeting topics. Right? One, collapsing the tracks, some kind of assessment of how that's going. We collapsed a lot of tracks, college prep and the strong college prep at the high school. We talked about that at length last year with then Principal Bacher. I'd like to know a year later how that has gone. Second, results of the pride survey when they're available for teacher uh, surveys. I'd like to have a presentation on that. Or, a or, or an update, you know, depending on however you want to do it. Third, curriculum. So it seems that to me the district is making a substantial investment in curriculum. We, we invested in a, um, well, we, we hired a uh, assistant superintendent with expertise in that area. The override funds um, were included a curriculum, two curriculum coordinators, one of whom we've identified. Uh, and then there was discussion and public comment around math tracks and uh, pacing guides and I think we could roll all that up into a curriculum night or a curriculum update for the school committee in the fall. Um, fourth one for me is just having some discussion as a, as a committee about conserving override resources. I have some thoughts on that, but I can do that as an update or I can do that as a, as a topic, but I'd like to, to have a discussion about that. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, just a, perhaps a quarterly update on special education, the things we talked about tonight, just looking at what we learn from tonight's discussion in terms of tracking student outcomes or demonstrating student outcomes or student benefit from all the investment we're making in that uh, part of our district. And that would include identifying SMART goals for the assistant director that we're hiring, again, presumably after we hire that person. Thanks. Is there a motion? Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second.